Good morning. My name is Margaret Chin. I'm the chair of the Committee on Aging. And I would like to thank uh, Chair Torres of the Committee on Public Housing for holding this hearing with us and those of you in attendance for being here with us today. <clears throat> Today's hearing will provide the committees with an opportunity to discuss and evaluate the services available for seniors living in New York City Housing Authority or NYCHA developments, how NYCHA's policy affects seniors and their families, and how NYCHA and the Department for the Aging, also known as DIFTA, can work together to best serve NYCHA's senior residents. Approximately 20.5% of the NYCHA population is over 60 years old. A growing preference among older adults is to age in place. That is, remain in their residence or community as they grow older. In fact, 96% of older adults in New York City are currently aging in place. This poses challenges for NYCHA as it can result in apartments being under-occupied, that is, the number of bedrooms exceeds the number of occupants in the household. NYCHA's new right-sizing pilot program introduced last year, which provides funding and support to aid families in under-occupied NYCHA apartments to transfer to apartments more suited for their family size is of particular interest to the committees. As in the past, NYCHA's right-sizing policy has been an insensitive to the needs of older adults, who makes up approximately half of all the under-occupied NYCHA apartments. NYCHA is also home to 12 naturally occurring retirement communities, known as NORCs, which provide seniors with a variety of services to help them age in place, including case management, healthcare assistance, information and referral services, transportation, and financial management. NORCs receive funding from the state, the city, or through council discretionary funds, or a combination of the three. This year, the state issued a new RFP for NORCs and awarded new contracts. As a result of this process, three NYCHA NORCs were not awarded a new contract and will lose their state funding. The committee will discuss what is being done to help close the funding gap that these NORCs now have in their operating budget so that services can be maintained. There are also two types of senior centers located in uh, NYCHA developments. Neighborhood senior centers operated by service providers through contracts with DIFTA and smaller social clubs, 17 of which are overseen by DIFTA and 14 of which NYCHA oversees. The committee will discuss how DIFTA and NYCHA work together to ensure that senior centers provide their services in a safe and habitable environment. Indeed, interagency coordination can be key to helping ensure that seniors' particular needs are met by the city. This hearing will provide the committees an opportunity to hear from both NYCHA and DIFTA on other ways the agency work together to serve the senior population and how such coordination can be improved. I would like to thank the staff of the Committee on Aging for their assistance in putting together this joint hearing. Our counsel, Kathleen Fahey, uh, policy analyst, Emily Rooney, and finance analyst, Daniel Koop. I also like to thank the committee, um, the members of the committee that have joined us here today. And we're joined by Council Member Rose uh, from Staten Island. And now we will hear from Council Member Torres, Chair of the Committee on Public Housing. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, in the interest of time, I'll just we'll, we should proceed with the first panel. Do we have? Okay, uh, we have Patton Fisher from Brooklyn Law School. Uh, Jonas Aponte, uh, Norma um, Blas, somebody else taking her place? Oh, Michael, what's your last name? Oh, Michael Grithal, okay. Okay. 
and Nora Moran from United Neighborhood Houses and uh, Jana Levine from Brooklyn Legal Services. Please join us at the panel. We also have an overflow room next door. Okay, you may begin. Good morning, Chairman President Torrey, Council Member Sheen, and Honorable Members of New York City Council. My name is Jonas Zaponte. I live at the service house on West 174th Street in the Bronx. My mother, Victoria Ponte, lives there from February 1992 until her death on July 17, 2012. I moved, I moved to the apartment in 2009 to, to care for her after she was diagnosed with advanced dementia. I filled out the papers to change my family composition of my mother's apartment twice, but Nisha refused. I'm here today to speak about my struggle to gain residency of my mother's apartment, which is my home. Aside for the occasion visit from home aid, I spent every part of, of my days taking care of my mother. I took her to the bathroom, I showered her, I dressed her, and one night she managed to get out of the bed and walk around the apartment, and she fell, hit her head, and she needed five stitches. Nietzsche claimed that living with my mother could create overcrowding, but I, I never felt crowded. She slept in her bedroom, I slept on the couch. I always felt that there was plenty room for the both of us. In July 2012, I told Nietzsche that my mother had died. They gave me a notice to leave. I went to court and stayed. They knew my mother had disability. They knew, my, they knew I was living with her. I wish Nietzsche could have told me from the beginning what I need to do. Nisha relayed my mother's right, no by me to the family composition. When she would not even remember her name, I hoped to get my, my state in my home. I did everything could notify Nisha when I moved in. I hope that they change the policy so people like, like me do not have the same problem in the future. Thank you for the time for listening to my story. Thank you. My name is Michael Grinthal from the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. I'm actually reading the testimony of Norma Blas, who is a resident of Vandalia Houses. Ms. Blas is ill today uh, and passed out waiting for the bus this morning, so ask, called me and asked me to read her testimony for her. My name is Norma Blas. I, I am 62 years old. I live at 77 Vandalia Ave in the Vandalia Houses in Brooklyn. My mother was Gilda Ramos, and I lived with her for almost 13 years. I moved into my mom's NYCHA apartment around 2000. I moved in with her because she was sick, and the doctor ordered that she have someone there 24 hours a day. She only had home health care four hours a day. She was 85 years old. She was blind and couldn't walk. She was bedbound and needed help going to the bathroom. She weighed 220 pounds. She had kidney problems. She had two broken hips, and she had Alzheimer's disease. She sometimes didn't recognize me or thought I was eight years old, but she didn't trust anyone else. I changed her diapers and bathed her. I changed her bedding. I fed her. I gave her medications. I slept on the couch or on a chair in her room. In the end, do you know how I fed her? With a bottle, like a baby. After a month, I asked management for permission for my mom to add me to the lease. I told them my mom was sick and needed me there 24 hours. They denied me. They told me, put her in the hospital. They said that it would be overcrowding for me to live with my mom in a one-bedroom apartment. I went back to management at least two more times, and they denied me every time. 
I stayed in the apartment because I didn't want to leave my mom alone. If I would have left her alone, I don't know what would have happened to her. She could have died. She couldn't move. After my mom did die in 2013, I had a nervous breakdown. My mother just passed away and NYCHA told me I couldn't stay in the apartment. They said it was because I was never added to the lease, but I asked at least three times after I moved in. Since then, NYCHA has been trying to evict me and I've been in court trying, <coughs> trying to defend myself. There was a petition in the building for me to stay there. Everyone in the building was saying, let me sign, let me sign. 55 people signed. I pay the rent early every month. I've never missed a payment. I wish they would take pity on me and people who are seniors. I'm 62 years old. We should be treated like people, not like nobody. Thank you, everybody, for being here and listening. Thank you so much for convening this hearing this morning. My name is Nora Moran, and I'm a senior policy analyst at United Neighborhood Houses of New York. UNH is the Federation of New York City Settlement Houses. We have 38 members across the five boroughs, serving over 750,000 New Yorkers each year. Um, our members provide a wide variety of services to over 80,000 older adults in New York City, um, doing everything from running senior centers, naturally occurring retirement communities, homes delivered meal programs, et cetera. Um, and our members also have a deep commitment to public housing and to a model of public housing that supports comprehensive community-based services for its residents. Um, more than half of UNH member organizations operate programs in NYCHA spaces, and there are a few that are located entirely within NYCHA developments. So our testimony is going to focus on uh, supportive services for older adults living in NYCHA housing, as well as capital needs in NYCHA community spaces. Um, our written testimony goes through some more information about supportive services within NYCHA, um, but we'll just raise a couple things. We know that many NYCHA developments are home to senior centers and NORCs, uh, which you know, predominantly serve older residents in those developments. Um, we know that these services are, are utilized by older residents. There was a 2014 study that indicated that approximately one in three older NYCHA residents attend senior centers and one in five attend regularly. Um, research also has shown that older NYCHA residents who live alone and are at risk for depression are more likely to be senior center users, which shows that senior centers have been somewhat successful at reaching potentially isolated residents. Um, so we know that these programs are you know, an important lifeline for older residents in NYCHA. Another area that's of particular concern to us that was raised earlier were recent results from the New York State NYSOFA RFA for the NORC program. Um, as was mentioned, there were three programs that the state had previously supported that are located in public housing uh, that were not awarded new contracts moving forward. So um, we know that you know, DIFTA has been working closely with these providers to understand what the impact is um, and ensure continuity of services, and you know, we, we encourage them to continue to do that. The other issue uh, that we'd like to discuss is capital issues in NYCHA spaces. Um, we all know that unmet capital needs are incredibly challenging for nonprofits who operate programming within NYCHA spaces, um, and neither DIFTA nor NYCHA is able to consistently provide the funding needed to maintain aging infrastructure in public housing. And as such, providers have waited you know, more than a year for severe issues like leaking pipes, cracked ceilings, and even open sewage to be addressed. Um, last year, UNH collected information about hundreds of open tickets for basic repairs at senior centers and other community spaces in NYCHA, and NYCHA was unable to address many of the problems that providers identified. Um, there's often confusion as to whether DIFTA, NYCHA, or another agency holds responsibility for these capital needs. 
Um, you know, these, these unmet capital needs cause uncomfortable and sometimes even unsafe conditions and, uh, you know, can also raise challenges around compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act in terms of, you know, ADA accessible spaces. Um, so we, you know, would encourage the city, you know, DIFTA and NYCHA to work collaboratively to ensure that service providers in public housing spaces have safe and comfortable spaces for older adults that are kept in good repair. Thank you. Good morning, members of the City Council. I'm Jana Levin, Senior Staff Attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, legal aid nonprofit where I represent low-income families and housing matters. NYCHA's current policy regarding family member caretakers does not serve seniors and people with disabilities. The ADA and New York State and New York City Human Rights Law required NYCHA to engage in an interactive process with a disabled tenant to find out what kind of accommodation she needs and to grant it unless NYCHA can show undue hardship. Instead, as we've heard, NYCHA has a blanket policy that it will always deny family member caretakers permanent residency if adding them will overcrowd the apartment, according to NYCHA's occupancy chart. Our client's mother, a senior citizen with terminal gallbladder cancer, was living in a one-bedroom apartment when NYCHA refused to add her adult son as a caretaker on the pretext that two people would overcrowd this apartment. NYCHA had the option to approve both to live in the apartment or to transfer them to a larger apartment, which is actually the accommodation that the senior tenant of records doctor gave a letter um, requesting that he be added so that they could be moved to a two-bedroom apartment because she needed his care around the clock. But NYCHA didn't do so. Our client moved in anyway to care for his mother. When our client's mother eventually died, NYCHA tried to evict her son, even though he had lived there for several years with NYCHA's knowledge, and his mother had twice sought a reasonable accommodation to add him permanently to the family composition. NYCHA simply ignored his mother's reasonable accommodation request, though she was a disabled senior, um, and wrote simply that it was denied because the apartment was a one bedroom and NYCHA considered it too small for the two of them. New York state courts have recently ruled in two cases, Aponte and Cintron, that NYCHA cannot have a blanket policy against adding family member caretakers in small apartments like this. NYCHA must consider permanent permission for the family member to reside if the need for care will be ongoing. I'd like to end by encouraging NYCHA to update its management manual, which is um, the book that and NYCHA relies very heavily upon in citing the decisions that it's making um, regarding tenants. Um, it should be updated to reflect ADA and New York State and city law. The manual should make it clear that a tenant with an ongoing or terminal disability, specifically, especially a senior, should be offered a reasonable accommodation to permanently add a family member caretaker and be offered a transfer to a larger apartment if needed. Thank you. And I notice we've been joined by the public advocate, so I'd love to give the public advocate an opportunity to make a statement. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So first, um, my name is Letitia James, the public advocate of the city of New York, and basically my role is to ensure that New Yorkers are receiving the support they need, particularly when it comes to government entities and agencies that exist to serve them. I want to thank the chairs, Council Member Torres and Council Member Chin and their staff for holding this hearing, and I want to thank all of the advocates who are here today. Uh, New York City must stand up for the seniors and others with disabilities that live in public housing and demand that they be treated with dignity and respect by NYCHA. After a lifetime of hard work and contribution to the city as taxpayers and residents, our elders deserve to live out their golden years in their homes and with dignity. But it's unfortunate that NYCHA is denying aging seniors and other individuals with disabilities, grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles, uh, to have family members move in to care for them. This draconian approach violates federal and local disability discrimination laws, as was mentioned by my colleague in the struggle with Legal Aid Society. And it flies in the face of cities aging in place practices and hurts our seniors and other individuals with disabilities who are denied access to care by their loved ones when they need it the most. It puts our families in an agonizing position, which watch helplessly as their beloved one suffers or defy NYCHA and risk the consequences of eviction. 
my office, along with 13 other elected officials and 15 advocacy groups, we filed an amicus brief in August in support of Jonas Aponte because he and his mother sought a reasonable accommodation of NYCHA's policy by requesting that, as our caregiver, he be added to our lease as a permanent household member. Unfortunately, NYCHA failed to make the reasonable accommodation. And my office has released a report about aging in place that calls on NYCHA to consider additional residents to tenant households and reasonable accommodations within the Fair Housing Act and the American Disabilities Act. The agency must also review all of its policies and procedures to ensure that they are consistent with the city's age, a city's age-friendly initiative, which should and must apply to residents of public housing. We also seek opportunities to further improve upon its programs and services for older uh, New Yorkers. New York City is, the, is at the forefront of innovation when it comes to sustaining the lives of the aging population, which makes NYCHA heavy-handed of policies around aging even more disappointing. These policies impact thousands of low-income seniors and others with disabilities living in NYCHA developments. And NYCHA, their current policy penalizes vulnerable elderly and disabled residents, and that must change. I thank you for inviting me here today, and I thank you for allowing me to say a few words. We have a couple more people in the first panel. We're going to call up uh, one more um, person for the, the first panel, uh, Mr. Guo Jianhe. They show up. And Roxy Chang is going to interpret for him. You I am a tenant that lives in Queensbridge South Houses. Uh, in 2015, I've requested the Queensbridge South Management Office uh, due to my disabilities for a transfer. Uh, um, I asked for a transfer to Flushing because it is in closer proximity to uh, for my medical visits. My primary care positions and facilities are in Flushing. Uh, uh, the NYCHA flushing office that I went to has also informed me that I fulfilled the requirements for transfer. 
南边的管理处，那个认为我不像是那个重病人了。Um, but the but the um Queensbridge South office manager um told me that I don't appear um sick, severely sick. So they did not um allow me to leave. So they did not um um care for my request. That under that circumstance, I was in 19 uh in 2015 in February. Um, so under these circumstances, uh, in May 2015, I, um, I submitted a new NYCHA application online. Uh, My application number was 1128964. 房屋局也给我了答复，说我是除了残障跟家庭暴力的以外，我需要等两年。I was told、um, by NYCHA that besides disabilities and domestic violence, that the application process would take a total of two years. 今年二月份，我曾经向房里房屋局服务中心查询我的申请状态。In February this year, I've asked, um, I called the NYCHA customer contact center about the status of my application. Their answer is that I have two months to wait. I was told that I will have to wait for another two months in order to have a response. Uh, until I get out of the hospital, I will have to ask again. So in July, uh, when I came out of the hospital, and I asked again. 呃，说我已说我的案子已经过期了，需要重新排队。I was informed that my case has expired and that I will need to start over in the process. 我现在经过两年了，我的身体情况日益恶化。Um, in the present, uh, my health has continued to deteriorate. 我的肾肾衰竭已经到了晚期。My kidney disease has uh, it's reaching an end stage. 医生说我随时有生命危险。Um, my doctor says I'm in danger in terms of my life. I hope to use this opportunity to help me to give me a hand. I hope that later departments can offer their assistance and help me get through these times. Thank you. And yeah, and and to handle these challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also been joined by uh, Councilmember Mendez, Councilmember Valone, Councilmember Kasowitz. Uh, I, I saw Councilmember Deutsch from the uh, Committee on Aging, and then Councilmember and our Majority Leader, Councilmember Van Bramer. You're on the Public Housing Committee. <laughs> You're not on aging. Okay. Thank you. You make it sound like a bad thing. No. <laughs> My condolences to you. Yeah, um, I, I do have a question, a, a few questions. Uh, first for Nora. So what, what exactly, you said that there have been work orders that have languished for months, if not years, right? What prevents NYCHA from making these repairs? Do you, do, is it a question of who's responsible, whether it's DEFTA or NYCHA? Can you just uh, clarify what the situation is? Um, Less of a concern of who's responsible, DIFTA or NYCHA. Our members have been sort of operating under, you know, we're in a NYCHA space, the work order goes to NYCHA. Um, you know, they've languished and been lost due to, you know, lack of funding to address the capital concerns um, and simply, you know, back, backlogs, large backlogs of, of work orders. And what is NYCHA's response to you? Does NYCHA take responsibility? For those capital repairs, or sometimes, um, and you know, they have they were meeting with our members for a while, kind of being committed to trying to address them. Um, we've stopped those meetings in the past couple months because they've been concerned about other challenges, mainly from the federal level. Um, but they have shown an interest in trying to streamline the process and and figure out the best way to move forward. But it's been difficult. It's it's senior centers and you know other things. Cornerstones, et cetera, aside from senior centers that are, are kind of in this boat. 
And can you provide us with some examples of the challenges that residents are facing in senior centers? Like sure. Um, you know, I think some are around ADA compliance. Um, to give one example, um, there's a senior center in the Amsterdam houses operated by Lincoln Square Neighborhood Center, and they um, and the bathrooms there are not ADA compliant because the building was built before the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. Um, and they, you know, Lincoln Square has not had capital funding to make the repairs. They've requested of NYCHA. NYCHA doesn't have the funding. And, you know, as a result, seniors who attend the senior center there just to use the bathroom need assistance of staff um, because they physically can't get in with their wheelchairs. Um, you know, that's kind of one example of some of the other challenges. Um, we've also had members who have had challenges with, um, you know, things like open sewage. In the spring, there was a senior center that had a, a standing puddle of water. This was the Meltzer Center um, run by University Settlement in the ceiling. And there were a whole nest of mosquitoes that sprouted as a result of the standing water. That one NYCHA did address and fix quickly because it was a, a more of a health risk. But it's things like that that just come up and, um, you know, it's hit or miss as to whether they're addressed quickly. Have you, and when, when NYCHA claims there's a lack of funding for capital repairs, do you reach out to DIFTA for funding? And if so, what has been the response? Um, our members haven't reached out to DIFTA for funding. Um, you know, DIFTA contracts typically tend to cover services and not capital repairs. Um, so they, they haven't tried that previously. But as far as you're concerned, DIFT is responsible for services, NYCHA is responsible that's, for the infrastructure that would be that's often as the landlord. That's how our members have, have operated, okay. yes. And does both DIFTA and NYCHA accept that basic division of responsibility? or? Um, I'm not sure. I couldn't okay. speak for either. Well, um, we, well, we will ask them. That's Stay how tuned. we've operated, yes. so <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have a question for the Aponte attorneys, or in the, the, the attorney in the Aponte case. If, and I'll try not to weigh in too heavily on the details of the case. Uh, is, is for the attorney in the Aponte case, is that? I'm a legal intern for Mobilization for Justice, and um, actually the attorney on the case is uh, Leah Goodridge, who's our supervising attorney. Okay, do you just identify yourself when? So I, I anticipate that NYCHA is going to claim that providing temporary permission could qualify as a reasonable accommodation. Um, do you believe it could qualify as a reasonable accommodation? If it's insufficient, why? Um, in this particular case with Mr. Aponte, his mother had dementia and she applied for permanent permission and uh, the main point is that NYCHA actually just summarily denied two requests for permanent permission. So there was no action whatsoever. And the second issue is that the distinction between permanent and temporary permission is that for permanent permission, once you're on, you're on. Uh, the other distinction obviously is you don't get succession rights. But for temporary, you have to reapply every year, even though you might be living there long term. For someone who has dementia, that particular disability really isn't suitable to reapply every year. Um, the main overall issue in the case really is just NYCHA's failure to respond and treat the issue appropriately. This was a 90-year-old woman who s was monolingual and um, needed help, needed her son to live with her. So there was no, there was just a denial, two, two denials. So if I understand your position correctly, once NYCHA is aware that a resident has a disability that would require reasonable accommodation, it's not enough for NYCHA to wait passively for a request for permission and then deny it summar summarily. There has to be some proactive effort to see to it that that resident receives reasonable accommodation? Is that your understanding of NYCHA's obligation under city, state, and federal law? Uh, NYCHA's, NYCHA's own uh, understanding is that, but 
practice and policy, unfortunately, don't really mingle very well. Um, for example, NYCHA has a general memoranda about how to treat senior residents and how to make social service referrals. So in this case of someone who is nearly 90 years old um, and, and who they've listed on their annual recertification that they do suffer from a disability, that would certainly merit a case where you refer for social services because perhaps they might not be able to pay their rent on time. Perhaps they might not be able to get down to the management office um, to hand in certain forms. So even before, right, um, there was a permanent permission issue, there might have been other issues um, that might have come about and it would have merited a social service referral. Uh, so in those cases, definitely yes. And in this particular case, um, what happened here was, was egregious because someone is putting uh, a landlord on notice that they have a disability, asking for a reasonable accommodation, and it's not being treated as such. So there was a denial, but no social service referral? There was no social, there was just a, a the first denial was on the basis of overcrowding, uh, which again, the reasonable accommodation would have been an exception to any overcrowding. It seems like the, the very notion of making a reasonable accommodation means you're making an exception to some rule, right? That, that's actually literally how federal, um, federal, city, and state laws, disability, and human rights laws interpret it, but um, that's not how it was treated here. So it would have been an exception. The second denial was based on um, what NYCHA said that Mr. Aponte signed on behalf of his mother who had dementia and that, um, he, that, that they wouldn't approve the application for permanent permission because um, they said he signed for his mother, even though they knew she had dementia. But. So there was denials, no Denial social service happened. referrals, and no apparent attempt at finding some reasonable accommodation for None. For Ms. Aponte, okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions or? Uh, I guess. Just quick, following that line of thought, and thank you. Uh, Margaret Chin and I had a hearing with these type of issues with DIFTA and APS. So Adult Protective Services has a responsibility to get involved with seniors in need with a disability on their own. And when you refer to the 90-year-old case without someone to have assistance. In your practice, have you seen APS involvement in these type of cases? You know, I think the issue here is that there wasn't a court case at this time. It was just a nine-year-old woman living in her apartment. So there wasn't a court. I, I've seen APS obviously get involved where there's a court case, but there was no court case at this time. We're talking about someone who wants to add her son to a reasonable accommodation. Uh, but even before APS gets involved, normally there is at least some sort of social service referral um, just on NYCHA's part. They do have a general memoranda for that. So on that point, have you seen a percentage of NYCHA referrals for social services then leading to APS? I'm trying to see the interagency action together with most of our hearings are to make sure our, our seniors in need, our persons with disabilities, and caretakers have the resource to not have to continually go through the wheel of services every time they deal with a different agency. And I'd like to see the coordination and the referral between the agencies when a case is opened so that it is then shared with their sister agencies so that the caretakers don't have to spend weeks explaining to the next person on the phone what the history, have, has there been any interaction in your eyes? Mm -hmm. No, no. No, I haven't seen much interaction. Um, what I have seen are at termination hearings where there's a social service referral for mental health, for potential mental health issues, and then uh, the referral comes back and approves the need for a guardian ad litem, and then a guardian ad litem is appointed. But I really haven't seen a lot of interaction between APS and uh, NYCHA residents, particularly pre-court, pre-litigation. So I think there's an opportunity there, Chairs, for us to have that coordination there and some legal services with simple documents like power of attorneys and healthcare proxies to help folks who find themselves in the upper echelon of age and, and need and, and fighting these situations without the assistance of some legal assistance. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vallone. I know the public advocate had a few questions as well. Yeah. So, um, how how can um, how could NYCHA arbitrarily and capriciously denied deny someone reasonable accommodation in the face of written evidence indicating that that an individual is disabled? I mean, are the workers who deny these requests are they do they have medical degrees? I think that part uh, I'm not NYCHA. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I can speak as a legal services uh, attorney who's represented tons of NYCHA residents, and uh, much of that has been advocacy in the development. I, I think that part of the issue is that there is a little bit of a um, disjuncture between the staff and the developments, and then perhaps there is an EEO office that handles, um, in part, some reasonable accommodation matters, and there is a little bit of a disjuncture. So for example, um, someone who, maybe a project manager who works in the development itself and not in, at the headquarters at 250 Broadway, might have seen this and said, this is not, yes, you're telling us you have a disability, yes, you're telling us you need reasonable accommodation, but we still, we still can deny this, and not really understanding that that's illegal. I do think that that's a possibility, but at the end of the day, um, obviously, whether that's the reason, but at the end of the day, clients and tenants are still being hurt by these actions. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Chin, I didn't get the gentleman's name who's from Queensbridge. Mr. He. Yeah. Could you please tell me the status of Mr. He's case? That obviously has touched all of us in this room. So uh, I've asked Mr. He if he wanted me to help explain the situation, and he said yes. So uh, his application was basically canceled, as is spoken in the testimony. So he, we just started a new application again. But Mr. He, I submitted his medical records along uh, and the doctor's letter along with the testimony because he's in a really severe situation. He's at the end stage of um, uh, a kidney failure. Kidney failure, renal failure. Are you represented by counsel? Um, Do you have a lawyer? Um, he does not have a lawyer. Okay. Uh, but we've been mm -hmm. also, um, we have also gotten help from uh, council member Jimmy from Bramer's office, so, right. um, you know, we appreciate that. And the great council member Jimmy Van Bramer is here, and, and I'm sure he'll speak. But let me just say, for all of my friends and advocates in the room and all of the attorneys who are here, particularly um, my former employer, Legal Aid and Legal Services, I would urge all of you to reach out to Mr. He. And I, but more importantly, I would hope that NYCHA would immediately address the needs of Mr. He and do that um, uh, today. Uh, this man is in the end stages of renal failure, and it's just really unacceptable and unconscionable that he's not receiving re um, reasonable accommodation. It's, it's obvious as the day is light, that this gentleman needs services at home. And so I would hope that we can resolve that today. Thank you. And we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Traeger, and Councilmember Mendez joined us earlier. Um, if there are no further questions, we'll proceed um, to the New York City Housing Authority. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you so much for your testimony. So we're joined by the Executive Vice President for Capital at the New York City Housing Authority, Deborah Goddard, uh, Lillian Harris, who is the Vice President for Tenancy Administration, Sadia Sherman, who is the Executive Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnership at the New York City Housing Authority, and Carolyn. Carolyn Resnick, who is the Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at DIFTA. And Carolyn Taylor, who's the Assistant Commissioner for Community Services at DIFTA. <laughs> Can you please raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before today's committee? Okay. 
You may proceed. Chairs Richie Torres, Margaret Chin, member of the committees on public housing and aging, and other distinguished members of the City Council. Good morning. I'm Sadia Sherman, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnerships. Joining me today are Deborah Goddard, EVP for Capital Projects and Acting EVP for Real Estate, Lillian Harris, Vice President for Tenancy Administration, as well as our partners at the Department for the Aging. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the authority's work to provide nearly 80,000 seniors living in our developments across the city with safe, supportive communities and access to quality services. The challenges confronting public housing in America today are serious and significant. From aging infrastructure to the growing deficits brought on by decades of insufficient federal funding. Mayor de Blasio and Chair Alate developed a long-term strategic plan, Next Generation NYCHA, out of the unwavering belief that this precious affordable housing resource for one in 14 New Yorkers must be preserved. With NextGen as our guide, we are providing safe, clean, and connected communities for all of our residents, including seniors who are aging in place. NYCHA is firmly committed to our seniors and believes that all New Yorkers deserve, an, deserve to age in place with <coughs> dignity in their homes. As anchors of their communities, Seniors contribute to the strength and vitality of their neighborhoods. But due to a loss of $3 billion in federal operating and capital funding over the last 15 years and a $17 billion capital need, we must rethink the way we do our work and focus on our core responsibility to be a better landlord. As part of that focus, we've moved away from directly providing social services to connecting residents to best-in-class services from the vast network of social service providers throughout the city. NYCHA helps our seniors thrive in a number of ways, from initiatives that positively impact all 80,000 seniors living in our developments to those that serve only our neediest residents. If you are a senior at, an, at NYCHA, you can benefit from physical improvements to our buildings, on-site services, connections to services, and age-friendly policies. As a landlord, NYCHA continues to focus on improving our buildings to enhance residents' quality of life. As part of NextGen, we updated the architectural design guidelines for the rehabilitation of our buildings, taking into account age-friendly and accessible designs, as well as DIFTA's age-friendly NYC report and HPD's guidelines for senior housing. Whenever the funding is available to upgrade our buildings, these standards will better support the safety, health, and comfort of residents, including their ability to age in place gracefully. Guided by the new architectural standards, we are investing about $4 million to make accessibility and age-friendly improvements at 89 developments, such as more comfortable seating areas on the grounds for seniors. The new LED exterior lighting that we're installing across the city makes it, makes it easier for everyone, including our seniors, to see. We are eager to get the funding necessary to complete more of these projects in the future. These standards apply not only to rehabilitation projects, but also to the development and preservation work we're doing. The new 100% affordable housing we're building for seniors, which I'll discuss later in my testimony, also incorporates age-friendly designs such as handrails throughout corridors, grab bars and emergency pull cords and bathrooms, and accessible apartment designs. All the building improvements and rehabilitation we're accomplishing through the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program complies with federal and local requirements that make it easier and safer for seniors to age in place. Thanks in part to Councilmember James Vaca's common sense suggestion, we're piloting a live-in care caretaker program at Boston Road Plaza, Middletown Plaza, and Twin Parks East. This means that someone is available around the clock to assist residents. This past week, we showed off this new initiative at Boston Road Plaza. NYCHA's newly reorganized Community Engagement and Partnerships Department fulfills the next-gen goal of engaging residents and connecting them to best-in-class services. By engaging key populations, including seniors, and connecting them to critical health and social services from community-based organizations and other city agencies, seniors are supported as they age in place at NYCHA. We know we cannot do this alone. This is why we streamlined the ways we partner with local providers through our new zone model, 
And this fall, we're surveying seniors to further identify the programs and services that they seek. At our 78 senior-only buildings in 12 Norks, which are naturally recurring retirement, com retirement communities, seniors and their caregivers are supported with on-site and nearby assistance. This includes one-on-one -on -one counseling, as well as recreational and cultural opportunities from DIFTA and many other providers. At the 10 NORC programs sponsored by DIFTA, homebound and non-homebound seniors are connected to services and get help with accessing public benefits and improving their health. For instance, the HUD-funded Senior Resident Advisor and Service Coordination Program provides on-site assistance to seniors in need to help them live safely and independently within their homes. Under the supervision of licensed social workers, senior resident advisors organize volunteer floor captains who make daily contact with other seniors on their floor. Partnership is key to serving our seniors. NYCHA works with dedicated providers across the city to meet their needs. For example, socially isolated or homebound seniors in all five boroughs receive regular home visits through Henry Street Settlement's Senior Companion Program. Senior companions are healthy, older adults who help their fellow seniors live independently by helping them go shopping, go to doctor's appointments or other activities, and obtain services such as accessoride or Meals on Wheels. Most important, perhaps, is the friendship the companions provide. DIFTA's Grandparent Resource Center provides assistance, resources, and supportive services to seniors who are raising young relatives at the, the 15 NYCHA developments that are part of the focus of the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety. Nearly 1,000 seniors and their caregivers have attended workshops on community safety, mental health, awareness, senior scams, nutrition, falls, prevention, child and elder abuse. We partner with an innovative organization, Older Adults Technology Services, known as OATS, which is helping seniors to use and make the most out of the latest technology. Through this partnership, seniors at Queensbridge Houses take classes on computer literacy, digital photography, financial management, social media, and health and fitness. Participants use technology not only to learn and grow, but also to communicate and socialize with friends and family. This fall, we expanded the partnership to four new sites, the Jefferson, Melrose, Mott Haven, Red Hook, and Stapleton Senior Centers. Three sites offer classes in multiple languages to meet the needs of NYCHA's diverse population of seniors. The 111 senior centers at NYCHA, including 96 centers and senior social clubs sponsored by DIFTA, provide a range of recreational, health, and cultural activities, services, and resources that enhance the lives of NYCHA residents and other seniors in the community. On any given day, seniors participate in free exercise classes, discussion groups, blood pressure screenings, at DIFTA-funded senior centers, older New Yorkers can get free meals, counseling on social services, or assistance with benefits. Regardless of where they live, every NYCHA senior has access to a program or on site or within their community. Last week, we launched new services for seniors at our UPACA development, Presbyterian Services, Cir Pre Presbyterian Services Circle of Care Program provides seniors a helping hand, whether it's assistance with transportation, buying and preparing food, paying bills, getting vital benefits and entitlements, doing household chores, or other daily needs. Circle of Care also provides caregivers with guidance, training, training resources, and interpretation services. PSS will talk more about the good work they're doing in their testimony today. This month, we're conducting resource fairs for seniors and hosting Domestic Violence Awareness Month events for seniors in every borough. We organize domestic violence awareness conferences every year to inform seniors about the signs of abuse and where they can get help. Additionally, we're providing new ways for residents to access health services. In collaboration with Harlem Health Advocacy Partners, we launched the largest ever NYCHA community-based health worker initiative which helps residents in five East and Central Harlem developments improve their health through health coaching and health care navigation services. In the past three years, nearly 400 seniors established specific health goals and received individual and group services. The program is led by the city's Department of, of Health and Mental Hygiene in partnership with NYCHA, the Community Service Societies, and NYU CUNY Preservation Research Center. We want to make sure that seniors have all the support they need from medical professionals and caregivers. For that reason, we will grant temporary permission for caregivers to join a household or other reasonable accommodations based on the circumstances. 
Providing a transfer to a large apartment with an extra bedroom for a caregiver can be a challenge, however, because of the, the limited number of vacant apartments available. The turnover rate at NYCHA is less than 2.7%, and the vacancy rate is even lower at 0.6%. Today, there are only about 1,100 vacant apartments available for occupancy throughout the, the entire authority, including about 432 bedrooms and 381 bedrooms are most sought after apartment sizes. Through NYCHA's reasonable accommodation policy, seniors with disabilities can request an accommodation that will make it easier for them to age in place in their apartment. That could include a move to a lower floor or an accessible apartment or an apartment modification such as the installation of a grab bar or a roll-in shower. There's not enough affordable housing for seniors in our city. We're using our land to build more. The 100% affordable housing we're creating for seniors across the city will include senior centers and dedicated programming for seniors. Four projects are in progress that will provide more than 650 new affordable homes for seniors at Ingersoll, Millbrook, Batanzas 5, and Sumner Houses. The new development at Ingersoll will feature a senior center offering a range of services from our partners service and advocacy for GLBT elders, known as SAGE, to support residents and the larger community. We look forward to partnering with stakeholders on more of these vital projects for the benefits of New Yorkers today and tomorrow. The stories of our seniors speak for themselves. Ms. Smith, a retired home, he home health aide, moved into Glenmore Plaza. It first opened in 1968. Her husband passed away in 1972. She continued to raise her children at Glenmore Plaza until they married and moved out. Now retired from careers in law, city government, and the like, her children gifted her with 21 grandchildren, 31 great-grandchildren, and five great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> Ms. Smith lost both of her legs due to diabetes, limiting her ability to do the things she once enjoyed, but socializing with other seniors at the Glenmore Plaza Senior Center and participating in its programs and events lifts her spirits and keeps her engaged. Mr. Williams has been a resident of Brownsville Houses for 45 years, a proud father. He raised five children there, three of whom, along with a grandchild, are now working in law enforcement. Mr. Williams has been going to the Brownville, Brownsville a senior center every day for over 35 years. He likes to keep his mind and body active through pool and table games with friends, health, exercise, and nutrition classes, and socializing over lunch. NYCHA supports seniors in a variety of ways, from senior center programming to dedicated services available at our senior-only buildings, from the new housing we're creating exclusively for seniors to our policies that facilitate assistance for caregivers. That said, with more funding, we could do more. We're eager to work with the council and other partners to identify funding for building improvements as well as additional programs and services that will support seniors as they age in place at NYCHA. Thank you for your opportunity to begin this dialogue. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. I will start with the remaining family member policy and what NYCHA understands to be its obligations to provide reasonable accommodation. Um, once you know that a tenant has a disability need for reasonable accommodation, do you believe that it's incumbent on NYCHA to be proactive in seeing to it that that NYCHA receives, re that that resident receives reasonable accommodation? So can you clarify your question? So once NYCHA establishes that a tenant has Alzheimer's, dementia, requires reasonable accommodation, caregiving, do you believe that NYCHA has an obligation to be proactive in ensuring that that resident receives reasonable accommodation? Is well, staff, property management staff are proactive in terms of submitting a referral. In a lot of cases where a tenant has dementia, they need additional supportive services. An APS referral may be um, required. Um, a, a, a guardian at litem may be required to take care of their you know, personal and financial business. So there needs to be a step where we take to make those referrals. So, so you agree that NYCHA should be proactive, proactive in taking in some action? Proactive and taking some action in terms of making a And, and if you referral. fail to be proactive, does that mean you're denying a resident reasonable accommodation? In some cases, we won't know that a resident needs a reasonable accommodation. I'm only speaking about the cases where you know that a resident needs a reasonable accommodation. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can fully answer that because I'm, I'm not sure how they would know that a tenant needs a reasonable accommodation unless the tenant states that they do. 
or the, if you receive a medical note confirming that a tenant has a disability that would require reasonable accommodation, at that point you do know. At that point, it's a different scenario. Obviously, someone submitted a note on behalf of the tenant. Staff should take appropriate steps to complete the reasonable accommodation. A reasonable accommodation can be made verbally or it could be made in writing. So if we receive medical documentation stating that the tenant is disabled and needs to be on a lower floor, then staff would take appropriate action to complete the reasonable accommodation request. And the failure to take action would constitute a denial of reasonable accommodation? It wouldn't be a de denial. So if I'm... I'm sorry, I'm just not clear on your yeah, question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Okay. If, if, if a tenant is shown to have a disability need, and I, as that tenant, let's say I'm a close relative who requests uh, permanent permission in order to seek a reasonable accommodation, you cannot simply say no. Just to I, clarify, I'm sorry, I just want to yeah. make sure I'm answering your question fully. In a situation where a live-in aid is required, the tenant could request a live-in aid, and we would process that request accordingly. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be a reasonable accommodation if they want to request temporary or permanent permission. In some cases, they'll submit a reasonable accommodation request for a living aid. It depends on which track it takes, but once we have the request and the support and documentation, we'll review But specifically process. on the hypothetical, if I'm a close relative who wishes to serve as a caretaker for a tenant who has a, a serious disability, and I request permanent permission, NYCHA cannot simply say no to me. You have to take some action to ensure that that resident has a reasonable accommodation. If the resident requests a family member to move in to serve as a live-in aid, of course we would evaluate it and make a determination based on the support and documentation that was submitted. So you simply would not say no? We would evaluate it based on its merits. Okay. Now my understanding is that, and what happens if you, if you say no? Then what happens? If we, if property management denies the request, there is a process where they get escalated to the public housing reasonable accommodation coordinator. For short, it's FRAC, which is a lot easier to say. Um, we received about 1,100 reasonable accommodation requests in the past 12 months, of which 10% was for a live-in aid. We've only denied one of those requests. Over 50 of them were approved and 30 are in progress. And so you only denied what request? We've only denied one living aid request in the past 12 months. And what's it, describe what that request is. Um, I don't want to go into the details of this specific case, but they did not provide any supporting documentation. So without supporting documentation, we were unable to make a determination. But the stats so, are... So medical documentation, there was no medical documentation? No. And despite efforts to get that information, we weren't able to. So you received no medical, uh, with regard, with respect to Ms. Aponte, you received no... Oh, Medi I'm not talking about the Aponte's case. I'm okay. talking about in general. Out of the 1,100 reasonable accommodation requests that we received, about 10%, 97, were for living aids. Of that 97, more than 50 were approved, one was denied, and 30 are currently in the process of being evaluated. Um, in terms of the Aponte case, I'm unable to speak about it because it's ongoing litigation, but I'm more than happy to answer questions about our general policy. I, I want to go back to the original hypothetical. If, if I'm a close relative and I request um, reasonable accommodation through permanent permission, NYCHA could reject me based on occupancy grounds? So to clarify, if you were to be added as a permanent household member, it would not be a reasonable accommodation request. It's simply a change in family composition to add you as a permanent household member. I, if I'm moving in with my mother yes. for the purpose of providing caretaking, how is that not a reasonable accommodation? So I just want to clarify and make the distinction. There's two tracks. One is temporary. You're moving in temporarily to serve as a caregiver. The other is you're moving in permanently as part of that household. Your income, your... So, your so, so that's a bureaucratic distinction, but in the it, real world, it, if, I'm, if I'm moving in with my mother who has dementia for the purpose of caregiving, common sense di dictates that that is a reasonable accommodation. It would be if you're moving in temporarily. So if it's you, permanently, then I'm not serving as a caretaker? I don't, it's it, the caretaking that makes it qualify as reasonable accommodation. We do have reasonable accommodation requests for live-in aides. So it would depend on the situation. Your mother would make the request that she wanted to add you as part of the family composition, and we would process it from there and evaluate it. But in your mind, if I'm moving in permanently, I just want to understand Nitra's position. If I'm moving in permanently for the purpose of functioning as a caretaker, for my mother who has dementia, 
in your opinion, that is not a reasonable accommodation. That's simply a change in the family composition. If you're moving in as a permanent household member and you're going to have caregiver responsibilities, that's not a reasonable accommodation. So that's NYCHA's position. Okay, I just want to understand what your position is. Um, what, what, what are situations where a tenant is rendered incapable by the disability of requesting permission? Can, what, how do you handle those situations? Can you please repeat the... If a tenant, if a tenant has Alzheimer's and is in no position to provide medical documentation demonstrating a disability need, how do you handle those situations? In most of those situations, the tenant is already receiving services. Um, either they have a case manager, they have a guardian, they have a family member with power of attorney who would be able to make those decisions on behalf of the tenant. And what if the tenant is not receiving those services? Then what action would NYCHA take? We would make the action of making a referral as necessary. Do you have written procedures specifically for caretakers that, that document how caretakers can provide reasonable accommodations to residents in public housing Absolute, we need it? Absolutely. We have internal policies and procedures, and we also have this information available online on NYCHA's website if you click on resources. Specifically for caretakers? It's specifically on reasonable accommodations. We also have the tenant um, handbook, which speaks about caretakers. Um, we are in the process of updating it to provide more information on temporary permanent permissions, reasonable accommodations, and other topics that we've received feedback from tenants that they would like to see more information on. So we do have that information available. So what if I'm living, say I'm a low-income New Yorker who's living in an affordable housing unit, and in order for me to remain eligible for that unit, I have to live there permanently. But then I have a mother who lives in public housing who has dementia, and I have to be with my mother 24-7. I have to monitor my mother 24-7, but that would require me giving up my apartment because I'm no longer primarily residing there. I'm no longer there on a primary basis. Um, what about if under those circumstances I was looking to obtain permanent permission so that I could have succession rights, so that I'm not giving up my affordable housing apartment in order to provide caretaking to my mother, I have the security of a home and I'm able to provide caretaking for my mother. Would you deny me permanent permission under those circumstances? It's hard for me to respond to that question because there is criteria, for example, if you wanted to be added as a permanent household member, you would have to, if you're over the age of 16, would have to pass a criminal background and sex offender check. So there's criteria that we would need to evaluate. So I, I'm not asking about those criteria. Yet you but can assume for a moment I'm not a sex offender or I'm not a criminal offender, right? Again, we would need to evaluate the criteria and make that determination. If you meet the and criteria... So, and so what would prevent you from... If, if I have to give up my apartment in order to provide my mother with 24-7 caregiving, what would prevent you from granting me permanent permission as a form of reasonable accommodation? Yeah, as long as you meet the criteria and it doesn't cause so Suppose that I overcrowd the apartment just by one person, just a technical violation of the occupancy so rules. So in those situations, we work with the families case by case and some instances. Do you work with the families in case by case? Or? We review each case individually. So you've made exceptions to your occupancy rules to provide permanent permission? I know that in situations where it would cause extreme overcrowding, for example, for I'm people. not talking about extreme overcrowding. I'm talking about overcrowding by one person. So overcrowding by one person, um, I believe that we would agree to it because it doesn't cause an extremely overcrowded situation. So you, you would make exceptions to your occupancy rules as long as it's not extreme, as long as it does not result in as extreme overcrowding. As long as it does not result in extremely yeah. overcrowded situation, okay, it that would be approved. That is not what happened with Mr. Aponte. So with Mr. Aponte, again, I can't speak to the yeah. specifics of that, but if there are any cases, yeah. you know, definitely bring them to me and we'll review but them. It, it's worth the record, let the record reflect that the inclusion of Mr. Aponte on a permanent basis would not have resulted in extreme overcrowding only in moderate overcrowding or technical overcrowding. So that seems to flatly contradict what you just told me. I want to address the community centers. NYCHA transferred most of its senior centers to DIFTA a few years ago, is that correct? Or, or you're, you've been in a years-long process of privatizing the operation of your <coughs> senior centers, is that a correct? 
Yes, so um, so we've been transitioning senior centers to DIFTA. Um, that process started in 2014. We've okay. transitioned a few in, in different waves. Um, so at this point, we have 14 senior centers, um, which are primarily the smaller centers um, that are being operated by NYCHA. And so when there's a need for a repair, right, suppose the oven breaks down mm -hmm. and you're no longer able to provide seniors with hot meals, who's responsible for repairing the oven? Who's responsible for paying for it? Sure, so we can both speak to this. So um, in general, NYCHA um, you know, has taken ownership and responsibility over the, the, the capital, the big building envelope and roof and structural issues. Um, and we've worked with DIFTA to the extent that they have expense money available to address repairs inside. I can have Karen speak to that further. Yes, this is an ongoing and continued partnership. Um, and when there are interior repairs, such as an oven, then the sponsor would come to us through Karen Taylor and the Bureau of Community Services. And um, generally, we can accommodate those within the bottom line. And if it's something that requires roof repair, HVAC, some very large capital expenditure, then we would talk to NYCHA about making that repair. But if there's, so if there's a need for repair, the correct thing for a service provider to do is not to go to NYCHA, but to go to DIFTA. Yes, they should come to DIFTA. And then you would and go. And we can help walk them through the process. Okay. And do you have a dedicated capital? Because I know my understanding is that DYCD has a dedicated capital fund yes. for repairs in community centers. Does DIFTA have a capital fund for repairs in no. senior centers? No, we do not. So how do you address those needs without a capital fund? One at a time, and generally we're able to meet that need with expense dollars. And when it becomes too large a number or outside of our scope, then we talk to NYCHA. So I guess my criticism here would be that NYCHA and DIFTA have been working for years on privatizing the operation of, sen of senior centers, but there's no mechanism by which to fund capital repairs in these senior centers after three years, we're no closer to identifying a mechanism for funding these repairs. Um, and that, I just find that troubling. So that, that, that do you want to comment on that or other? No, I mean, I can just add that, you know, we certainly understand those concerns and, you know, we've been working together to, you know, our first priority was getting centers up and running and the operating dollars in place for those programs. We're working to really, you know, lay out roles and responsibilities, make sure that's clear for our sponsors, and identify the, the funding needed to deal with these day-to-day -day repairs. I guess by what logic is it sensible to have a capital fund for, DIFTA, uh, for DYCD but not for DIFTA, for community centers but not for senior centers? Like, I don't understand the discrepancy there. Can I follow up? Please. Can I follow up with that? Because um, <clears throat> there was a report by the New York City Comptroller and one of the, um, the issue was raised that there's no memorandum of understanding between DIFTA and NYCHA in terms of the structural um, deficiency repairs. So is, is DIFTA working with NYCHA to develop a memorandum of understanding, like who's responsible, who's supposed to do what? Yes, we are in those discussions, they are ongoing, and we are looking forward to having a memorandum of understanding. It, requires some investment, so OMB is involved in those discussions, and um, we hope to get there soon. Is there an MOU between DYCD and NYCHA? So um, we have an uh, initial MOU from our early partnership, and we've actually, we're updating that agreement, um, as well as working on the DIFTA agreement. Yeah, I mean, like, if you have it with one agency, it doesn't make sense you don't have it with, with DIFTA, because you all operate in NYCHA building, and most of the senior centers um, in NYCHA building needs some upgrade and repair, especially in the bathroom. I have one in my, in, in my district. The bathroom is the children's toilet seat. You know, it's, it's not accessible. And we want to help I'm advocate for a capital budget line for DIFTA because these are the center that really needs the repair. And for NYCHA, I think you would definitely love to support us on that because that's mean revenue for you to fix up, you know, the building. So we got to really work together uh, on those because the seniors still go to the NYCHA Center, especially the NORC program. Um, so have there been any discussion 
about the three NORC program that did not get the uh, state RFP? How are we going to um, be able to maintain and continue them? Karen, are you going to answer that? I'm going to try. Um, yeah, there were three, um, three programs, uh, two of which were funded by both DIFTA and uh, New York State Office for the Aging for NORC services, and um, a third, Grand Street Settlement, which was funded through council funding and the state. Those three programs um, responded to a state RFP recently and were not re-awarded. Uh, it resulted in some significant loss of funds, excuse me. <clears throat> um, so we, but all three, well, all two of the permanently funded DIFTA programs, of course, still have their DIFTA funds as well. And we've been talking pretty extensively with each program to try to identify what what this would mean in terms of loss. Would it mean a staff person? Would it mean uh, certain types of services that, you know, that would be problematic? Um, each of the, what the state requires is that each program also provide match, matching funds, either in kind or in cash. So we've been talking to the programs about whether they would still be able to provide what they had previously provided to the state in terms of matching funds, which sort of helps um, allay some of the problem as well. But it's, again, it's ongoing discussions as, and I'm sure many of them will be coming or have already come to the council to discuss this as well. And if I might add to that, there is um, advocacy with, from the community and directly from DIFTA to NYSOFA about the impact of the result of this RFP. I don't think they quite understood what the impact could be, so there may be some movement on the state level. Do you know when? I mean, this is already October. I, I can't respond to that, but uh, the grave concern has been brought to the attention of the State Office for the Aging. Okay, I mean, like, we've got to have a backup plan uh, because uh, they're coming to the City Council. And I think OMB also really need to, to look at this because we cannot allow these programs to shut down. I mean, I think that's really something that we want to make sure we prevent. Um, we were joined earlier by Council Member Salamanca. Oh, Council Member Ballone. Thank you, Chairs. There's, there's larger macro issues and there's smaller micro issues going on in this hearing, which is why this is so important. Um, but Karen, with the transfer from NYCHA to DIFTA, has DIFTA been given any additional capabilities, staffing, resources, or funding to handle the new responsibility now for these structural repairs to the NYCHA buildings? Oh, repairs or operations? Well, repairs first, because we just went through the process of, of them now calling you and you not having that additional so we do not have additional resources for repairs we did get funding for operations and food and staffing etc um, and the repairs as I mentioned if we have accruals or additional expense dollars in our budget then we're able to make the more minor repairs and when it becomes a large capital expense um, then we go to NYCHA so then a dedicated a dedicated program for that would be something that we should all support. I think at this point, giving you the ability to have the team, the staff, and the resources to deal with this growing concern and problem throughout the city, uh, instead of just dealing with the expense side on your internal budget, is, is a difficult way to handle capital repairs on NYCHA. I'm trying to think of a solution going forward with budgets that we can all coordinate our, our committees on to target, especially since we have our public advocate here taking notes at the back of the table. <laughs> So with, with NYCHA, going back to the very, very, very first step, you had said that when, a, when there's a power of attorney or a guardian or an APS file on place, that you can coordinate with that, and there's already steps for social care in place. My concern always becomes when someone doesn't have that, and you said we make the determination to the referral for social services. How is that done? How is that initial when we find a senior in need or a person with a disability living alone? This is my question for whatever committee we're on, whether it's APS, aging, DIFTA. My concern is the very first contact with who the employee from the city of New York is sending into an apartment or making the phone call to decide if somebody needs critical care or additional care of some. How is that process determined? 
So we had APS actually conduct a webinar for us in, um, I believe it was in August, for all the property management staff, just to talk about the services that they offer and how to make a referral and what things to look for. And we're going to continue to do this on probably a quarterly or every six-month basis because I think it's very important information for them to know. And then we also have an in-house um, system, which, you know, Sadia could elaborate more on. That was my bill, by the way. They didn't do that because they just wanted to. That was because <laughs> in previous hearings we found out this wasn't happening, so we did put that in. Sure. So to Lillian's point, um, you know, the first point of contact for most of our residents are their, their frontline staff who are in property management. Um, and, you know, as she's mentioned, they've been trained. They understand the policies and procedures with respect to APS. Um, if a property manager is not able to connect a resident to an external service or there's a need for a, a, a touch point before that, they would typically refer to our office. Um, we have a family partnerships team, um, which is a team of uh, community coordinators as well as um, some licensed social workers who are able to then follow up on that referral. So they would reach out to the tenant, make that initial point of contact, and then be able to then make that handoff to APS or another external agency. Um, you know, so as property I, managers, those are the folks. So the property managers. That's are the, first the front point line of, of defense. So typically, that's the first point of contact. Not necessarily, but almost always, right? That would be the first point of contact. Um, and if a property manager is not able to engage, for instance, for you know, maybe they're not able to get the tenant to open the door or engage with them, um, they would reach out to our team for that assistance. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, NYCHA obviously is really focused on being a landlord, and we've moved away from direct service. So our goal is to make sure that we're able to to get into the apartment, make an assessment, and then get someone to the right provider. Um, more often than not, that is APS. when you get into APS. the apartment to make that decision, is that when it's referred to APS or additional services? So it can be services? referred directly to APS from, you know, any anybody, any any NYCHA staff person. Um, if the NYCHA staff member uh, is having difficulty engaging the, t the tenant, typically they would call our team so that they have a, you know, that sort of sensitivity um, in engaging the resident and being able to connect them with the service. That and they how need. would we find if they had a guardian power of attorney or a guardian at litem appointed? Mm -hmm. So sometimes that information is known as it's in the tenant folder. It's in the tenant folder, and usually um, power of attorney, guardian at litem will contact property management to let them know and provide them with paperwork um, so that we're aware that they have, you know, uh, these resources. And does that tenant folder then include the referral to APS and whatever case management file is then opened? Are they coordinated together? Well, the referral is actually done online to APS, but there are notes indicating that a referral was made on this date and usually a little bit more detail on that. So is there any done. coordination back and forth as to the determination if APS decides additional services are needed that the tenant folder is, is, is marked with that additional service? It depends. I know if there's an active case manager, it will be noted. Um, if there's light touch services, I'm not sure how that's um, handled. I'm looking for a global case management type of process. We, we did it with corrections, you know, when a, when a, when a detainee is discharged with services and then um, medical care and health care and, and tenant services provided. If there's recidivism and they're brought back in, there's a folder then, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, and I'm seeing there would be seems better coordination between the agencies dealing with this one person who may have to open four different files. And there's such a backlog, as Karen has gone over for, for years, with APS and case management. I can only imagine with the referral from NYCHA that this backlog is only going to grow. Yeah, your feedback is very valid and actually very timely. We're in the process of digitizing our files. Um, the challenge is everything is kept uh, in paper, and some of the files are literally as big as a ream of I paper. Can so we're in the process of digitizing files so that we can connect all of those pieces of information. So this is something that we're working on in the near future and we're very excited about. That would be a perfect update for a hearing for just to get that, and whatever resources you need, we want to help in that process. We want to streamline that so that it's quickly at your information. Um, and I think Chair Chin with Aging has been advocating for slower case management time and staffing and, and who's making those decisions. So I just bring that to the table and I thank you for your responses. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Yeah. I just want a few more questions and then I want to proceed to the public advocate because I, I have some confusion about NYCHA's policies regarding remaining family members. Right. I have been led to believe by some officials in NYCHA that NYCHA will decline to provide permanent permission when there is any level of overcrowding. You told me now that only in circumstances when there is extreme overcrowding. So which is it? So Chair Torres, I'll follow up with you to get clarification because I don't want to provide any misinformation. Or 
is the answer in your procedures? Because if the answer is in our procedures, and again, I will yeah. definitely close the loop with you on that. And, but you oversee the process that governs remaining family member status. Right. So, for so if you're confused, I'm concerned that the lack of clarity invites capricious and arbitrary decision making. No, absolutely not. It's it's very clear cut and dry. And as a matter of fact, in order to standardize and improve the process, we're bringing it completely online, so that when um, a NYCHA resident requests temporary permanent permission, there's going to be smart flows and guidance that will help them make that determination. So um, there'll be less discretion. Yeah, I'm in the just process. concerned about the conflicting information about your own policies, but I want to proceed to the public advocates. So. so when will this information be online? We have a um, uh, for temporary and permanent permission yeah. um, by the end of the year, which means by first quarter annuals. Residents will have the ability to request um, temporary and permanent permission or even remove family members, which is huge, and we're very excited about that. And will there be training for staff? Absolutely. There will be training and communication also to residents so that they know they can access this um, functionality through our self-service portal. Can you articulate the criteria necessary to establish reasonable accommodation? It's a need. So if the tenant feels that... Um, for example, they're disabled, they need to be on a lower floor, they can submit a reasonable accommodation. Some reasonable accommodations, they're broken out into two categories, mm -hmm. basically, a transfer and an, and an apartment modification. Mm -hmm. So a reasonable accommodation could be as simple as a grab bar being installed in the shower, or it could be a transfer to be closer to a medical care provider or to a lower floor. And for um, a family member to reside in the residence, can you articulate the criteria yeah, that if, a reasonable sure. If a tenant is requesting a live-in aid yeah. um, on a temporary basis, they can go to property management and make that request. They'll need to fill out a form, a temporary permanent permission form, and provide support and documentation, and that gets evaluated by the um, housing manager. For a reasonable accommodation, the process is pretty much the same. They fill out a reasonable accommodation form along with support and documentation. If, for some reason, property management feels that they cannot approve the request, it gets escalated to the FRAC, and the FRAC will do a review. Um, in some cases, they'll reach out to the tenant to get additional information so that the appropriate um, determination is made. And that living aid includes family members? It can include family members, yes. And so um, is there any uh, documentation that one would need, such as a medical documentation? Yeah, usually um, the primary care provider or um, would submit documentation stating that the tenant, you know, requires 24-hour assistance or whatever it is that they need, and they'll submit that as part of the request. So you were here during the testimony of Mr. Yi, right? Yes. And you heard that the allegedly someone at Queen Queensbridge said he didn't look sick enough. That to me, honestly, is um, disappointing. Um, and you would I'm, agree that that's inappropriate, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I will follow up on that case. I actually have a note to get his information, and I'm going to look at the details. I would that. appreciate that. Absolutely. And I thank you for that. And how does um, NYCHA proactively inform seniors and or disabled residents of the services and caregiving options available to them? Usually it happens at the property management level, mm -hmm. um, but as I stated earlier, we're making changes to our tenant handbook so that we can add additional information um, we also have certain articles, like in the NYCHA Journal, on different topics. We had one on temporary permanent permission, um, succession policy. So we'll do more um, work in terms of advocating and letting them know what services are available. So, you know, as I traveled throughout the city of New York and visit NYCHA um, developments, some property managers, so there's, they're not, there's not consistent answers with respect to all of the information that we just discussed. How do you ensure that there's consistent information throughout NYCHA, throughout NYCHA. Yeah, I mean, that's very con concerning to hear. Um, what we're working on, of course, training is part of the day-to-day -day in terms of ensuring consistency and standardization, but we're working on a lot of automation. Mm -hmm. So if there's a reasonable accommodation request, having smart flows so that there's not that much discretion, same thing with temporary and permanent permission. And we're hoping through automating our process and increasing visibility in terms of reporting um, that we would tighten up the standardization. And will that also be, um, I'm sort of old school, I like technology, but a number of seniors in NYCHA facilities, or seniors in general, they like paper. So is it going to be written um, in materials? There'll always be an option for paper, yeah. um, so yes. And is there a requirement, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 
I thought earlier during the exchange with Council Member Torres, is there a requirement that one be referred to APS or have a guardian ad litem before a reasonable accommodation is made? No, there's okay. not a requirement, but um, his question is if you could tell someone has dementia and they need services, what's our responsibility? So I was just elaborating on okay. that. Okay. And lastly, you would agree that there's a general cost saving to NYCHA and to the city of New York and to taxpayers um, to provide um, reasonable accommodation to family members who request it as opposed to them living in a nursing home and or having a, an, a professional living aid? Yeah, absolutely. And on a personal note, that issue is near and dear to my heart. My great grandmother is 103. God bless you. And she has a live-in aid, and we would never consider moving her. So, from that perspective, whenever I deal with reasonable accommodation requests or think about the tenant, I always put myself in their seat. I, I thank you for that. And I too can relate to that as someone who took care of her mother until she was 97. She didn't want to live in aid, she wanted Tish James <laughs> and nobody else. So, obviously, a family member is someone who is close and someone who they can relate to. Um, and so I hope that we can make sure that uh, these reasonable accommodations for family members are um, uh, resolved and taken into consideration. And I thank all of you for your service. Thank you, Public Advocate. Um, I just want to follow up with a, a couple more questions. Um, but first, a comment. Because um, NYCHA, I keep hearing that NYCHA just want to be a landlord. I mean, a good landlord, I hope. Um, and it, it bothers me because um, I think the public housing to a lot of families, you know, low-income family, immigrant family, it, it was something like if you got into public housing, it just meant that you had an opportunity to really do better. Um, and public housing always provided more than just housing. It provided support and social service. So I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that to just become a landlord and, and really don't you know, take into consideration the families, the seniors, the people who live in public housing, all right? Um, that they do need support and the social service part is still vital mm -hmm. so that we don't just, you know, when they go to the management office um, to ask for help, or whatever, that there is a mechanism there that they can get the social service help before we have to refer them to APS, a social worker that can really help them navigate and, and just kind of build that comfort level for them. And I just really want NYCHA to have that compassion and not be so cold with just landlord. You know, that's when you hear just landlord, you don't have that compassion. Um, and I hope that NYCHA will forever have that compassion for the residents. Um, now, there was about 18 senior social club that was transferred over to DIFTA from NYCHA, because NYCHA is, is not running these um, centers anymore. So can you give us an update in the progress of these? Are they turning into regular senior centers? Are you providing um, similar oversight? Um, to these social clubs as you do to DIFTA centers? Because I know that there's the, the budget that's been allocated, it's not baseline. So it's like year after year, like when are these, cent you know, these social clubs or these uh, NYCHA centers gonna be incorporated um, so that they can have the regular funding to keep going? My understanding that the funding is baseline in the DIFTA budget. Um, the fun <laughs> no, n for the 17 social clubs, uh, that funding was uh, made permanently a part of DIFTA's budget, and that is for operations. And uh, if I can remember all of your questions, how are they doing? Um, it's it's a mixture. Uh, there are uh, they're all still alive and well and serving the communities. Some have, have grown. Um, I think the probably largest average daily attendance we have at some of them is around 40 per day. There are some that are still serving only in the teens uh, every day. 
uh, the variety of services, um, most of them have through, even though originally this was not part of the plan, but through uh, the dedication of many of our wonderful providers are now receiving meals, uh, mostly prepared by, at other DIFTA sites. And um, services, you know, services have grown. Health promotion activities are provided at all of these programs as is case management, or case, not case management, case assistance and uh, assistance with benefits and entitlements, education, recreation, and um, they are, for the most part, they're thriving. I think we, we do have, um, you know, some are in very small spaces. A couple are actually in apartments, which, uh, have with you know some limitations on expansion, but um, but they're doing okay. But those are those are what you call the social clubs, right? right? Mm -hmm. So NYCHA still oversee about fourteen of them. Oh, you're talking about the NYCHA centers. That's what that's was. The I'm sorry, in. I was talking about the ones that were transferred to DIFTA. No, no, I okay. I just realized it was still NYCHA still have some, and that was the three million. Fourteen. I think that was allocated so are there any plan to transfer the rest over um to difta sure so we're in constant conversation with difta um you know this has been incremental where we would continue to survey those locations um and see if they you know reach the point where they can be transitioned but at this point they're being funded by the city um you know both NYCHA and difta are committed to making sure that all the seniors who are being served today continue to have services so are there any kind of deadline in terms of evaluation, are they gonna, is NYCHA gonna continue them or are you gonna transfer over to DIFTA? At the moment, we don't have plans to transfer them over to DIFTA. We have surveyed, if you recall um, initially, and I remember sharing that data with you, we had surveyed all of the NYCHA centers and the 17 that we took over met at least a minimum threshold to operate as a social club. And the remaining 14 are either very small or similar to the ones that are in apartments. The, the site is very small. So they don't make it to a threshold to operate as a DIFTA center or actually either as a social club. So we continue to talk. Um, we have not really resolved moving forward, but you know the another option which we always make available is to keep seniors apprised of all of the other neighborhood services in their communities and generally and we've done some mapping to show that we have nearby you know neighborhood centers or even innovative centers. Well what about and we turning could have them, transition plans turning them into like a NORC model? Were there any consideration for that? Because yeah. as the senior population grows, I mean, there are probably residents in the building mm -hmm. um, that are senior, but they're not going um, mm -hmm. to the social club. Yeah, they could that, be more. that has been discussed. I think that uh, the NORC model uh, hasn't been, um, because these are really center-based, the NORC model, as you probably well know, involves really engagement of partnerships in the community and residents and, uh, and NYCHA. NYCHA has been a, a great partner in the NORC programs that we do fund. Um, but the model is a little bit more complicated and more restrictive in a way because there are um, like multiple partnerships that are involved in that. The, um, when the, we do have another NORC RFP, um, we will certainly be open to looking at that again. And as NYCHA mentioned, I think in your testimony, I know there are a number of other developments within the NYCHA portfolio that would probably qualify in terms of density as an org program. But. Yeah, I think going forward, we gotta f figure out what's the, the best way of utilizing the, the resources that we have. Um, I mean, we gotta make some decision with those programs. Mm -hmm. So if they're only serving a few seniors, how do we maximize um, the resources that more people can be served? Um, I also just wanted to add that DIFTA services in general are offered and available to NYCHA residents. So other than attending a senior center, of course, if a senior is eligible for case management services or a home delivered meal or our ICEP home care 
um, funding benefits and entitlements that is all available to any senior that is living in a NYCHA facility. All right, I'm just gonna um, move to another question um, tonight for NYCHA about the your right sizing uh, reasonable accommodation initiative um, that's where went into effect in uh, 2016. So can you uh, give us a little update and how that's been going and how many seniors uh, have moved um, to a you know, different apartment under this program? Sure, um, I, th I think you're referring to the right sizing pilot program. Yeah, the well, pilot, the pilot program. Yes, yes. Um, if it's okay, I wanted to provide some background information for the um, members of the public that are here. So um, just to be clear, I wanted to state up front that we're not evicting anyone over right sizing. HUD requires um, public housing authorities to ensure that tenants are living in the right size unit. And I understand that this could be very challenging for seniors who have resided in their units for many years. Um, but at the same time, it's a, a balancing act in trying to balance all these considerations because we have families that are in overcrowded situations and also a lot of families on the wait list waiting for larger apartments. Um, so our policy requires tenants who are living in a unit that has two rooms more than what they need to right size. And at the time of the annual recertification, they're notified that they need to right size. And at that time, we expect for them to take action by um, signing up for their development wait list or borough wide wait list. The biggest challenge with right size that we currently have is that there's not enough inventory to move families to. So they're in a larger unit, we need to move them to a smaller unit. And just to put it into perspective, the most popular size unit is two bedrooms, and there's less than 400 units currently available today. And there's a lot of competition for those units, from victims of domestic violence to emergency transfers to uninhabitable. So with the right sizing pilot, we wanted to test ways to expedite right sizing. We offered a cash incentive and fully paid moving expenses. We started in April of 2016 and we ended the program in May, uh, end of May of 20 of this year. Sorry, there's really bad feedback. Um, 500, over 520 people signed up for the program. Ultimately, 170 people, 71 people ended up right sizing. The vast majority dropped for various reasons, including their reluctance um, to right size. Um, of the ones that did right size, more than a third were seniors, so we're really excited about that. In fact, the first family to right size was a senior couple, and um, we featured their story in, um, the NYCHA, in our NYCHA um, employee paper just to talk about their experience. Um, and again, the lessons learned is that families are reluctant to downsize, and the other piece is that there's really not enough inventory to expedite right sizing. It took us over a year to move 171 families. So are you gonna continue the pilot? No, the pilot was discontinued at May 31st. Um, because based on lessons learned, there was no way to expeditiously right size families. Uh, so you spend 8.4 million on the pilot? That was the budget, but we didn't spend that much because we didn't right size 400 families. We only right sized 171 families. So how much did you actually spend? Um, probably half the budget or less than half the budget. Uh -huh. So from the lesson learned, um, are you gonna continue um, implementing the, the positive experience that you have learned from this? Well, we currently have our regular right sizing policy. Um, from the lessons learned, we, we did find opportunities to improve our right sizing program mainly just by automating it. So if a tenant needs to right size, they'll get notification of their options and then you know we can help facilitate them getting on the wait list of their choice. But are you gonna still provide, you know, like services for seniors, especially seniors, um, when they do get an apartment that they could downside to help them with moving expense or Right now, there's no funding to assist with moving expenses for right sizing. Take some of the money out of the 8.4 million, right? I mean, that's one of the issues to really help, especially seniors, um, help with the moving costs and help with actually packing and moving, especially if they don't have you know, families and whatever. I mean, that's the compassion thing that was missing in the beginning and why the pilot came in. Uh, so I think that should be some of the lessons learned that, 
you got to help people, I mean, especially seniors, so that um, that they can you know feel comfortable moving into a new apartment. So I think we should definitely you know fight for some resources to be dedicated uh, to do that. Yeah, and we're looking at ways to make it easier for um, families, including seniors, to right size. All right, we'll keep an eye on you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, back to a question about. Um, Capital repair. Um, this uh, senior center is in um, Councilmember Mendez district. So it's the university uh, settlement neighborhood center. And it took NYCHA six months to fix a large hole in their ceiling because DIFTA and NYCHA was shifting back and forth, like who's responsible. And now there's a large hole in front of their women's restroom. Um, this is in the Melsa center. And so they're still waiting for the repair. So when can we expect that to be done? A big hole in front of the well, woman's Actually, bathroom. I should, uh, before I let NYCHA respond to this, I just wanted to say it didn't, six months, the, the, the problem was repaired many, many times. I think one of the, this was probably due to a leak, and it was repaired many, many times, but there were other extenuating circumstances that perhaps NYCHA can address at this point. What's that? Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning. I'm Brian Clark, Senior Vice President of Operations for Property Management. Yeah, I'm familiar with the issue over at Meltzer. I mean, it's in a, you know, it's a, the first floor in a, a multifamily, you know, building with multiple floors up, uh, up top, and there were a series of multiple leaks. The plumbing infrastructure there, very old, um, needs to be replaced. Uh, you know, it's part of our capital challenge. Um, and uh, when these issues do come up, uh, we go out, um, we repair it, okay. and then, um, unfortunately, uh, times it will reoccur in a different spot. Uh, the current situation, I'll have staff take a look at, you know, today um, to figure out what the issue is, and we'll get it fixed right away. Because that is itself is a senior building. Yes. Yeah, so I think that if there's other issues um, relating to the leak, must be coming, you know, from upstairs. Um, yes. Yeah, no, I know, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we, we believe everybody, you know, deserves to have a, you know, safe, you know, clean, um, you, know, you know, apartment, you know, building. Um, but this is part of our challenge with, when you know our, our last capital needs figure was you know seventeen billion dollars in unmet capital costs, uh, the the plumbing there does need to be upgraded. Um, we don't presently have the funding to do it, so what we have to do now is we pretty much on an as needed basis will respond to leaks and make repairs accordingly. Now, so that I get that's where it, that DIFTA comes in, and NYCHA to kind of get some kind of agreement so that you can streamline and. We will be allocating for DIFTA to have a capital budget line because we will never have enough money, but we got to find a way. I mean, this is a senior center, right? So then DIFTA oversees senior center. So DIFTA needs to have a capital budget that can help NYCHA get it done and get it fixed. Uh, absolutely. We fully support any way to get more resources into the agency. In this particular case, because it's in a first floor in a multifamily building, um, you know, with apartments, you know, above it, um, you know, the, the, the capital need um, really is from, we'd love to get it from the city, we'd love to get it from the federal, um, but um, um, from a DIFTA perspective, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the funding is more targeted towards, um, you know, center, you know, improvements when it's complicated by uh, the, you know, the, in, the existing infrastructure of the building, that's really a, you know, NYCHA issue to uh, resolve. But I think that I, I Councilmember Mendez is not here, right? But I know that as council member, we're more than willing to help and to work with you um, to advocate for the resources. Because if the repair is not done quickly, then it's going to get worse and it's going to cost more money. What we'll um, do is we'll prepare an estimate and um, we'll see what, uh, see what we can do yeah. in working with you. All right. Thank you. I have a few more questions. Although, is there a, is there a plan to create a capital fund for DIFTA? There, there, no, there, there isn't, but uh, we okay. certainly would welcome that. Okay. So, so, in, so in the absence of a plan to create a capital fund, <coughs> like how do, we, how do we solve this problem? Because we're going to be in a never-ending cycle of disrepair for NYCHA senior centers. 
constant finger pointing, no clarity about who's responsible for what. Like, well, I, I don't think it's fair to say finger pointing, and I, you know, I we we just reviewed this particular case. We do go in and make repairs as we can make them, and when there's a larger infrastructure problem, then we turn to NYCHA for their support. Do you believe DIFTA should have a capital fund? It's a bigger issue. I mean, we have CDBG funds that have very strict regulations around how we can use them. Um, we have a very small capital budget in general, mm -hmm. so it's it's an ongoing larger issue, not just for NYCHA, but for the entire agency. Well, we got to make sure DIFTA gets a capital fund, okay? That's going to be part of our advocacy okay. for the seniors' budget. Good. Uh, it's like, it's about time. It should be in the year of the senior, the decade of the senior. We're going to we're gonna get it done. I have a few questions about um, rice sizing. What, what are the number of under-occupied units in public housing? Do we know what percentage of the public housing stock is under-occupied? Um, in terms of under-occupied units, I believe it's about 33,000, of which 11,000 are extremely under-occupied. And I believe more than half are senior households. For both categories? I'm not sure about both categories. Combined, it's about half. Okay. So we don't know if the extremely under-occupied units, if that's primarily seniors or non-seniors? I just don't have that stat okay. with me, but I can provide it to you. And how many people have been right-sized? Right so in the past year, um, we completed 2,100 right-sized transfers. And how does that compare to years past? It's usually about consistent. And of last year's numbers, um, 65 were senior households out of the 2,100. So the vast majority are non-seniors? Correct. Okay. And how were you able, so 2,100 tends to be the average It's usually number. based on our turnover rate, so usually it's pretty steady state. But, but your turnover rate is essentially the same every year, right? e Exactly, right. that's So it's point. essentially 2,100 every year? But I can confirm the numbers of past years with you, but t in general, that's what it is. And you said among the actions that you've taken to encourage right-sizing has included a cash incentive? Yes. Was that specifically targeted targeting the extremely under-occupied? It was targeting the extremely under-occupied um, that opted for a borough-wide transfer. How much were you offering? $5,000. And how many tenants said yes? Um, ultimately, at the end of the program, only 171. 171 out of? Out of the thousands that we did outreach to. Was some thought given to increasing the cash incentive? Some thought was given to increase in the cash incentive um, midway towards the program, but in evaluating our um, turnover numbers and available units, it, it would take us a very long time to right-size families. So what would end up happening is that we would offer more cash, we would have a longer um, wait list or a bigger pool of people interested, but it would take us just as long to right-size these families. So what's, what's your capacity? What's the number, what's the maximum number of people you could right-size? consistent with turnover? That I would have to get back to you on because it's based on a projection. Um, I don't know that offhand. Because it seems to me there are families that are languishing in the shelters that have no home. And the best units for those families are extremely under-occupied units in the public housing stock. And so we should be making every conceivable effort to transition those families out of the under-occupied units and free up those units for families who need it in the shelters. Uh, and w I believe we're in agreement, but the issue is, as I stated earlier, yeah. like the two-bedroom units, there's only less than, you know, 400, and that's citywide, and there's so many different competing priorities. Um, so from a technical standpoint, it's very difficult for us to free up units. Well, I mean, we don't know, right? It, it, I'm assuming if we were to offer more, uh, more generous cash incentives, we don't know how tenants would respond to those incentives, right? We've only experimented with a $5,000 cash incentive. We don't know how people would respond to a $10,000 or well, $20,000 cash incentive. The, the main issue with right sizing, again, wasn't necessarily the cash incentive. It would have been great to have more people excited and interested. But at the end of the day, it took us over a year to right size 171 families, primarily because of our available inventory. 
So even if we offered a larger cash incentive, we would have more people signed up, but we would have limited availability based on our housing stock to move those families into the you know, right size units. That was our biggest challenge. And so how do you expedite? So what you're telling me is that even if, even if every tenant were willing to right size, you simply lack the capacity to transition those families. Yes, it's very difficult. Okay. And, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and like, what are the strategies for addressing that capacity issue? If there are any, I don't know. Do you have any ideas for how to I mean, the dramatically only way off the top of my head is to no, not off the top of that. I'm, I'm assuming some. I imagine housing stock. You, you, but you've I mean, done some. Way. You've done some projects where you yeah. build some uh, senior housing, right? You were able to transfer seniors out of some of the, you know, oversized unit into senior building and you free it up unit. So there's got to be some plan to maybe build more senior housing so that you could free up those uh, you know, under-occupied units. Yeah, we are building. We've got four projects in the works right now. But again, you know the timeline on something like that from start to finish. It's not an overnight either. It's about a five-year cycle. But yes, we've got four projects for seniors only. But are you going to closely coordinate the two? Like is... is um, how do I word this? The the okay. effort to right size is going to be closely coordinated with the effort to create senior housing on, or yeah, are those two separate those really initiatives? Are, they really are two separate. So I guess that's our criticism yeah. is maybe it should not be two separate initiatives. Well, these are, um, these, it's not public housing. They have a preference, but we can't force them to move into this new housing. And we, we but, can't. But, but stipulate. No, but stipulate that the residents are willing to move. Mm -hmm. The issue then becomes nitrous capacity, and you address the capacity constraints by creating more housing on public housing land, right? So it would seem to me nitrous should be, the, the right-sizing team should be speaking to the senior housing development team at NYCHA, that they should not be siloed, because if we free up, if we're able to move a family from an, an, an extremely underoccupied unit to, or a senior citizen from an extremely underoccupied unit to a s new senior housing unit, you're killing two birds with one stone. Not only are you providing the senior with brand new housing, you're providing a family in a shelter with an apartment in public housing. It would seem to me that those two initiatives should be closely coordinated. I take your point. I think it's a matter of um, making sure that the seniors who are severely, uh, whatever, I'm not good at that phrase, um, know of these opportunities. I take your point. Yeah. So. I guess that's one request that we will have is if, if you can just give some thought to how you can coordinate those initiatives uh, because this is an issue of ongoing concern to the Public Housing Committee, to the Aging Committee. I know there was a protest recently by, what is it, Metro IAF mm -hmm. uh, requesting senior housing on public housing land to address precisely this issue. So um, I'm looking forward to a plan of action, both on the need for a capital fund for NYCHA senior centers and the need for greater coordination of right sizing and senior housing development. Uh, with that said, that's the extent of my questioning. So. Mm -hmm. Or pontification. So. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to call up the next uh, panel. Uh, Young Hee Kim. Um, Sandy Myers from Self Help. Uh, Beatrice Encarnacion uh, Badru from uh, Housing Court Answer. And Andrea Tang from Legal Services. From Housing Court Answers, Beatrice Encarnacion. Oh, okay, you're there, Beatrice. Sandy Myers. 
from self-help? Can they hear us from the next door? Yeah, okay. Andrea Chang from uh, Legal Services. Oh, you're there, okay. Cynthia Hill? Yes, please come forward. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Should okay, we start? Should I go first? I'm yeah. Beatrice. Yeah, start. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Beatrice. I work with or for Could you put the mic closer to you i work for housing court answers as the bronx nitra assistant so i'm in um the bronx nitra court at, eight, at 851 grand concourse and i work with nitra tenants on mondays wednesdays and thursdays and every time i'm there i hear um these stories from the tenants and just a few of them that I wanna share. Um, I've been there for six months, and in these past six months, I've seen this one person um, five times, so she comes an average of, she, she probably comes to court every month. Um, she's disabled, um, she lives at home with her adult son, and she's asked for um, a reasonable accommodation in terms of trying to get um, grab bars installed in and around her home. Um, and just recently I saw her last week and she suffered a fall, um, which is not the first fall that she suffered in her apartment. Um, she now has her arm in a sling. Um, she's in severe pain and it's because of the leaks that are in her apartment that haven't been addressed in, in the entirety of her tenancy there and because um, of the lack of grab bars in and around her apartment. Um, and I wanted to share her story because it's, it's it, I think about her a lot. Um, there, are, there are also other families that I think about that I wanna share their story here today. Um, there's this one woman who lives in the Bronx. Her daughter is paralyzed, she's in a wheelchair, and she lives on a very high floor in her development and the elevator is constantly out of use, so the child misses many days from school because she can't get the help to transfer, to transport her daughter from the very top floor to, to the bottom of the floor for her to go to school. Um, and she's repeatedly asked for a reasonable accommodation to, for a transfer to another development or to a lower floor, and as of yet, it still hasn't been honored. Um, and I, I also talked to a lot of seniors whose reasonable accommodations have been denied for their caretakers to come live with them. And I also come into contact with lots of seniors who are living with repairs that are not addressed. So if there could be just some way to have the request of seniors to be considered, considered a high priority or st streamlined in, the way that, in a way that it gets uh, taken care of in a way that's in a faster way um, so that these seniors aren't dealing with these kinds of, itch kinds of issues um, this late in their life. Um, our coordinator who's on vacation wanted me to bring up some of the issues that she sees. Um, and one of them are um, the lack of repairs that senior citizens are facing. Um, and that NYCHA should extend their reasonable accommodation policy to allow for senior citizens who live alone um, to allow their family members to live with them, which is what we've been hearing about this whole time. Um, but yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Do you know if the, um, the people that you met with, um, have they, do they have legal representations? Some of them do, some of them don't, and it's very hard to obtain legal representation. Um, they have to be very aggressive in trying to get one. Um, we do provide a legal handout to tenants with agencies that offer free legal representation. There must be, 
I think 12 or 13 on the handout. And I do also refer tenants to Leah Goodrich that, that are in the Bronx. So some of them do, some of them don't. I wish all of them did have, um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, okay. I mean, I, I would recommend that you know, they do get the referral because we have put a lot more resources for legal services. Yeah. I want to make sure they get connected. Yeah, the I other provide referrals and so does the judge. Judge mm -hmm. Sanchez also okay. provides referrals. But sometimes they can't get to the physical places where they should go to get referrals. You have to call them, the, the offices constantly, and you have to call them on specific days and times. And they usually, the, like, you need a whole nother, it's like a part-time job trying to find legal representatives. Yeah, and also I think you should also make sure to refer them to the local council members. Yeah, and because I Because from the council office, you know, we can try to expedite and try to connect them to legal services. Yeah, a lot of the times they, we try to, when they've spoken to me, they've exhausted every possible, if not all of them, but a lot of them, possible resources that they can go to. And there's still, there, a lot of times I don't know what to tell them because they've gone to their council members, they've requested for a reasonable accommodation, they've filed a grievance, they've spoken to me, I've referred them to Leah, God knows how many referrals they get in a day. So if NYCHA could, could, could just do it, well, well, we'll follow up with you on that. Thank you. Okay. Next. Can you identify yourself? Hi, um, I am from CAB. I am going to translate what um, Ms. Kim, who is the resident of Queensbridge. Can you also identify yourself? Uh, your Sanae Bian from CAB. Hi, uh, my name is Young Kim. I am a resident at Nitra Queen's Bridge House for about five years. I am also a member of CAB Organizing Asian Community. I with CAB, I'm fighting to improve language access and to protect public housing in New York City. I have osteoporosis and I used to be on the wheelchair. And my husband walks with the aid of Cain, and he cannot see with his left eye. 저는 어 저희는 6층에 사는데 이곳 아파트에는 엘리베이터가 5층까지밖에 없습니다. We live on the sixth floor. For our development, the elevator goes up up to only the fifth floor. 제가 다리가 아프기 때문에 6층까지 엘리베이터 없이 다닐 수가 없습니다. Because I have black problems. Going up and down the stairs from the fifth floor to sixth floor and sixth floor to fifth floor um, a few times a day is very painful. So my husband and I decide that we want to transfer to a different apartment. So in 2015, we visited the NYCHA Management Center. 업친 데 덮친 격으로 관리 사무소에는 한국말하는 사람이 없어서 대화를 할 수가 없었습니다. 멀리 사는 딸이 할수 없이 와야 했어요. 사무소에서 닥터 메일을 가져오라고 해서 갖다 줬습니다. Um, another difficulty was there. The management office um, and us were not able to communicate since there is no one to translate for me. 메일 so my daughter, who lives uh, far, asked the management office. She had come. She had to come, and she asked the management office um, if there were any apartment openings. And the office said that they need doctor's proof uh, of my con my medical conditions. So I provided all the necessary documents. 매일 월요일마다 딸한테 오피스로 전화해서 확인해 보라고 해서 1년 가깝게 했습니다. 몇달 후에 발 닥터 노트로 다시 가져오라고 하더군요. 그래서 또 갖다 줬었습니다. The office also asked my daughter to call the office every Monday 
to check in about the apartment openings. She did, so my daughter did it almost about a year. However, there has been no new um, openings. And later, the office asked us, asked us to bring a note from a food doctor instead of our primary doctor. So we did it too. 또몇 달이 지나서 또 닥터 노트가 없다고 했어요. 두 번이나 갖다 줬는데 말입니다. A few months later, the office, uh, the management office, has also said that they never received any doctor's proof from us, me and my husband, despite that being a false. That's lie. Mm -hmm. uh, 아파트 자리 나기를 기다리는 동안 저는 계단에서 굴러 어, 내릴 뻔도 했습니다. 제가 아파서 두 번이나 기절도 했었는데 어, 9.11 회원들이 저보고 6층에서 5층으로 어, 걸어 내려가라고 했습니다. 제가 서질 못해서 저를 의자에 앉히고 저를 어, 날랐습니다. 몸이 부서지는 것 같았습니다. While this process to transfer was going nowhere, my husband and I almost fell down the stairs many times. I fainted two times at home. When 911 came, they asked me to walk down the elevator um, on the fifth floor, which I could not do it. So they put my body on a chair and they carried me to the elevator on the fifth, fifth floor. And I felt like my body was crunching. 우리가 언어가 안 돼서 따지지도 못하고 막연하게 살고 있는데 캐부 선생님께서 길을 열어 주셨습니다. 저는 이런 일이 생길 때마다 굉장히 소외감을 느낍니다. Um, when I go to the office, I do not receive the service that I need because of the ignorance um, and they 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 don't even try to provide any language access to us. Um, when that happens, I feel very um, isolated. 나이 차에 지역 사회에 대한 적은 책임감이 약자들을 위험에 빠뜨리고 있습니다. Nichas lack of accountability in communicating with tenants is putting the most vulnerable tenants in danger. 캐버가 저희 동네에 앉았다면 안 왔다면 저는 이 일도 도움도 어, 못 받았을 것입니다. 그러나 분명한 것은 이건 캐브의 일이 아니라 나이 차가 저의 어, 수프로서 매니로 저로서 그리고 집 주인으로서 일해야 하는 일이라는 것입니다. 또 선출된 의원님들도 저를 책임져야 할 의무가 있습니다. I want to make it clear that um, this is NYCHA's job. It's supposed to be the job of NYCHA, our landlord, property manager, and super to manage this matter diligently. Um, hearing this testimony, um, I hope that elected officials would also help us help me in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, council members and esteemed colleagues. My name is Andrea Ten, and I am an advocate at Legal Services NYC, a provider of legal assistance to income, low-income New Yorkers in all five boroughs. We welcome the opportunity to give testimony before the committees. Uh, legal Services urges the City Council to inquire into NYCHA's policies and practices governing additions to tenant households and reasonable, reasonable accommodations for tenants, which fail to consider the needs of its senior and disabled residents and violate federal, state, and local human civil rights laws. Uh, NYCHA's procedures stipulate that no one may be added to an existing tenant's household unless the tenants request permission in writing and the development's management grants it. Tenants may either request to have an additional person join their household permanently or on a temporary basis. Permission to add a person permanently is only granted when there is a familial relationship um, between the tenant and the additional person, and the proposed addition will not cause overcrowding under NYCHA's occupancy standards. Unlike requests for personal additions, requests for temporary residence do not require a familial relationship, and permission may be granted even if the addition results in overcrowding. However, tenants cannot request to transfer to a larger apartment to alleviate the consequent overcrowding. Therefore, seniors, senior tenants that reside in one-bedroom apartments and require the assistance of a living aid or a relative caregiver can only request temporary permission to add their caregivers to their households, and if they're approved, they will be required to reside in conditions that NYCHA itself deems to be overcrowded. 
since temporary permission may be renewed every year, disabled tenants and their caregivers are expected to live in overcrowded conditions indefinitely. Through its policies and practices, NYCHA violates the reasonable accommodation provision of the Her Fair Housing Act that requires landlords to waive or modify traditional rules or practices if necessary to permit a person with disabilities an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. Moreover, NYCHA disregards its own reasonable accommodation policy and has directive which require landlords to engage in an interactive process to explore possible accommodations because neither NYCHA's procedures manual nor its management manual include provisions for the approval of household additions as reasonable accommodations or for interactive process. NYCHA's failure to accommodate the needs of seniors requiring living caregiving has given rise to repeated litigation involving our organization. For instance, in July of this year, Legal Services NYC signed an amicus brief along with elected officials and other advocates um, that was filed with the Court of Appeals in support of uh, the petitioner responding in the matter of Jonas Aponte, who testified earlier today. Uh, in that grievance, again, NYCHA denied remaining family member status to Mr. Aponte because he had moved in with his mother, a senior that had dementia, without management's written authorization. NYCHA had previously denied Mr. Aponte's respondents, um, Mr. Aponte's mother permission to add him to her household because of overcrowding concerns instead of exploring other options that could have accommodated her disability, for example, transferring her and her son to a larger unit. Um, Legal Services uh, is also currently representing relatives of deceased NYCHA tenants in grievances, where, as in Mr. Aponte's case, NYCHA violated disabilities laws by denying tenants permission to add their family caregivers to their households. In one case, NYCHA did not allow the tenant's son to move in with her, uh, with her, even though the tenant had dementia and would leave her apartment in the middle of the night and could not remember how to get back to her apartment in several locations. The circumstances forced the tenant's son to move in with his mother and the family lived in overcrowded conditions for seven years while facing the risk of of eviction. Uh, in another case, the tenant's caregiver's son made several attempts on behalf of his mother to request permission to live with her, but was denied permission several times because management required that the tenant request permission herself, despite knowing that she was disabled and needed her son to help her with that process. Um, her, son, the, her son, the caregiver, is now being evicted while suffering from terminal uh, renal cancer. NYCHA plays an important role in bridging the affordable housing gap for seniors because it provides housing to a significant low-income aging population. Thus, it is critical that NYCHA act as a policy leader in this area instead of denying reasonable accommodations requests that would permit seniors to age in place with family caregivers. Furthermore, policies that allow seniors to age at home can result in financial savings to both individuals and the government programs that pay the cost of nursing facilities and other long-term care. For all the above reasons, we urge the committees to inquire into NYCHA's practices and procedures involving reasonable accommodation of seniors before hundreds of other public housing seniors are denied their rights and their remaining family members face homelessness. We thank the City Council for addressing these important issues. Hi, my name is Sandy Myers. I'm here from Self-Help Community Services. I had a little uh, printer glitch this morning, so I submitted my testimony electronically, so you should already have it there. And I'm just going to highlight a few points about areas for improvement and streamlining some policies that will make our ability to serve older adults in New York a little bit more uh, streamlined and easy, it, both in facilities and NYCHA developments and then with clients who reside in NYCHA properties. So first, one um, minor change that was recently brought to our attention that's already placing a, an undue burden on our staff relates to one of our senior centers that is located in a NYCHA property in Flushing, the Latimer Garden Senior Center, where the uh, key that our staff uses to get into the development is battery operated. And when the battery would stop working, my colleague would be able to get it fixed at another location in Flushing. And just a couple weeks ago, that got moved, so she needs to come into Manhattan to get the key replaced, or get the battery for the key replaced. And this takes up a lot of time of her staff where she's not able to serve her members and leaves her social worker to kind of hold down the fort at the senior center. So if we're able to look at that, that tweak, we would definitely appreciate um, NYCHA's flexibility on that. 
A couple other things related to our clients who reside in NYCHA who are largely served in our case management programs. So as we've heard throughout the morning, there's an ongoing issue with repairs, which is something that we're seeing as well when um, a client has something from a leaky faucet to um, leaks in their roofs to um, issues with the toilet. Um, it seems like they are handled as they come in. There's no real triaging that our clients are, or at least that's their perception of it. Um, and then when our caseworker will reach out to NYCHA to follow up, um, it seems like it's just in the queue. But the more significant issue is that if something was not addressed properly, the resident has to file another complaint um, and needs to wait for it to be addressed. So there's no real follow-up mechanism in place, and we would really like to see that introduced. Um, we also have an issue with some of our caseworkers trying to get into NYCHA developments to do home visits. So as part of our case management program, uh, the requirement from DIFTA is a certain number of home visits, but sometimes the intercoms in certain NYCHA developments are not working. So that leaves our caseworker waiting outside often for someone to come in or leave the development to be able to go in, and that's obviously not ideal, um, nor is it safe, so we want to make sure that those are repaired, which would obviously serve the broader community, but also our caseworkers who are trying to get into the building. Um, Another issue that's come up on a couple of occasions is with bed bugs, um, where NYCHA will tell our residents that they have to first pre-treat their belongings, and this is cost prohibitive for many of our homebound, low-income older adults, and can also be physically challenging for many of them. So unfortunately, because they can't always do that and they don't have the assistance to do so, bed bugs still often persist, even if, if and when NYCHA does come in to actually treat it, if the resident is not able to take those precautions on their own first, it's, it can be challenging. Um, and lastly, another thing that's been brought to our attention through case management is the issue of the mailboxes. So if a resident's mailbox is broken, um, and if we're talking about homebound seniors in this case, the resident needs to go down to the management office to present a photo ID to have the mailbox repaired but we've been told that our caseworkers can't present the ID on behalf of the client, and for those who are homebound, this it's such a minor thing, but it means that their mailbox won't be replaced, um, and the same applies for actually home health aides too. So we've been seeing this issue, and again, it would be a small fix that would really improve the quality of life for our residents. Um, that being said, we know that while space is at a premium in New York City, the partnership that DIFTA and NYCHA and the providers like self-help have is critical. We want to see it continue and we want to be able to address these problems, but having a senior center or a Newark located in a NYCHA development is really core um, and such a critical um, service for our residents. So with that, I'll pass it off. off. Thank you. Do you mind? Uh, good morning, my name is Cynthia Hill. This is my first time at uh, a council hearing with this. I, I'm so happy that you have them. I truly appreciate it. So good morning. Um, I don't have a prepared speech, uh, but I do have something to say. I am, I am an advocate for the seniors in my building. I am 62. I was a, a public employee worker, worked for the city for 30 years, and retired, and I'm living in an apartment that was previously private and NYCHA took it over. What a disaster. They took it over, and it is horrible. Uh, some of the conditions in that building, uh, I live in Queens. Let me, let me tell you where I live at, 8909162. I live in Queens, a place called the Shelton Houses. Uh, I am a resident. Uh, I work for the resident association there, so I try my best to help the people as much as I can. However, we have engaged in so many problems there. There are water issues. There are elevated issues. Uh, I'm shocked that we're even having a conversation about people able to stay in the apartment with a person that has dementia. In my building, I've lived there for 45 years. They have never, ever had anyone stay with a senior. Never. They have. That is totally against their policy. So when you said that today, I'm like, really? There's a policy? I didn't even know there was a policy. Uh, there are so many people in that building that are sick and cannot get a person to come in to stay with them, not even temporarily. Okay? That is something that is a no-no. 
that you cannot come down there and say, listen, I need my daughter to come stay with me because uh, my mother has dementia or whatever. That does not exist. So that's non-existence. Uh, when, when they were up here talking, I'm like, are we talking about the same place, NYCHA? It's, it, it's non-existent. They, they, they provide no temporary nor no permanent uh, condition for, for the seniors there. The seniors, uh, the, as far as the social worker, at one, when, when I first, uh, when NYCHA first took it over, yes, indeed, they did have a social worker, somebody that was certified. The person that is in our building as a social worker is not a certified social worker. Most of the time, the people that need APS and stuff, anybody in my building can call. The social worker doesn't have to do it because she's not really a certified social worker. So I don't, I, I, I'm trying to kind of figure out what is NYCHA talking about with this. So they don't, they don't have a social worker in my building. Uh, as DIFTA is, and we have a senior center there. They had a leak there. Uh, in DIFTA Center, that was closed for nine months, waiting for the floor to be fixed. It was horrendous. So when I sit here and listen to NYCHA and say, I, I just don't understand what world am I living in because I know that these things go on. Right now, I am experiencing something. I was, uh, I was on vacation. I came back. Uh, there was a leak like six months ago on the ninth floor, 9L. Uh, they were supposed to fix it. They never fixed it. Uh, when I went away, there was a leak in my build in my apartment. Uh, in my apartment, as as I told you before, that was privately owned, so they had wood floors there. Right now, as I'm sitting here, there is a hump right by the door where I go in and out. I'm waiting for NYCHA to do something about it, and I'm waiting, and I will be waiting because NYCHA does not do repairs. So, if there's anything that you can do to help, I wish that you could help to change that because I feel that seniors are not getting anything in NYCHA. Thank you for listening. Excuse me, your, is your building a senior building? Yes. So we should get the address and really track it down and see. Okay, it's 89-09162 oh. Street. It's called the Shelton Houses, S-H-E-L-T-O-N, Houses. Thank well, thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Um, Sandy, just uh, a quick question about the capital budget for NYCHA, I mean, uh, for DIFTA. Yeah. Um, no worries. Were you surprised to hear that DIFTA doesn't really have a capital funding? A little bit, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it would definitely, it, yeah, it would help, I'm sure, to, to address some of these concerns, but... It, it was a little surprising to hear the difference between DYCD, I guess I heard yeah, DYCD does have has a capital, a capital budget and DIFTA does not. And I would be curious if there are any other, um, like a UPK program maybe, kind of how that works as well. So I would definitely recommend having a consistent policy. So if one city agency or multiple city agencies have capital budgets, then yeah. it would be probably helpful for DIFTA to have one. Yeah, we should look into that too. Yeah. That's a good suggestion. Some of them, yeah. the daycare center, whether right. they have it or not. Right. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for being here today, the panel. Um, the next one, <coughs> Molly Kokwasi from JASA, uh, Madeline Endosen. Uh Ida Reyes. Catherine Martinez and uh, <coughs> Runa uh, Raja Gopal from the Bronze Defender. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, my name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA. Um, I wanna thank Council Member Chin, uh, Council Member Torres for convening today's hearing. Um, JASA's mission is to sustain and enrich the lives of aging New Yorkers in the community, enabling them to connect with people in places that give them meaning. Uh, our varied programs provide a continuum of care to over 40,000 older adults in New York City. 
Uh, we have a long-standing productive relationship for more than 30 years with the New York City Housing Authority. We currently have five DIFTA contracted senior centers located in NYCHA sites, Throgs Neck, Sukinsburg, Bay Eden, Williamsburg, and Cooper Park. In addition, JASA provides Newark supportive service programs at Bushwick Highland and Surfside O'Dwyer Garden Dep Developments, as are in Brooklyn. Um, many other NYCHA residents avail themselves of JASA case management, elder abuse prevention, caregiver support, and other services. JASA is pleased to have the opportunity to speak to the positive relationship we have with NYCHA as well as some of the challenges we face in hosting programs in NYCHA developments as well as those that our clients experience as tenants. Co-locating senior centers and programs within NYCHA housing makes sense and serves a great need within the community. Several NYCHA sites are NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities, where people moved in when they were young, raised their families, and have now grown older. In 2013, NYCHA proactively sought out a proposer to develop a, NOR a NORC program in Bushwick Highland Development. And as part of the process of proposing a new program at that site, at JASA's request, NYCHA facilitated engagement between uh, JASA and residential leaders, um, promoted resident um, buy-in, and enabled JASA to create a responsive application. And with NYCHA's support, JASA successfully secured funding from DIFTA for the program. Most recently, NYCHA supported JASA's application for the New York State Office for the Aging during a competitive RFP process. We were able to secure new state funding for the program in Bushwick Highland, which is, um, as you know, a big deal since so many of the current NORCs did not get fund refunded. Um, we were also able to secure ongoing NYCHA SOFA funding for the Coney Island Active Aging NORC program, which serves the Surfside O'Dwyer Gardens development. NYCHA's performance tracking and analytics department was very helpful in providing information for these applications. It's clear that NYCHA recognizes the importance of enhancing services to its growing older adult tenant population. The elderly are among the most vulnerable of NYCHA's residents. Conversely, there are many older NYCHA tenants whose lifetimes of experience may be supported and directed towards resolving community concerns. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. We've done a lot of fantastic programming within the NYCHA buildings. We've had a lot of support from NYCHA for the programs that we've done with them um, and that have uh, occurred in their um, programs and in their buildings. Um, unfortunately, there are challenges that interfere with NYCHA's commitment to and efforts on behalf of its senior residents. Many relate to an aging infrastructure across NYCHA housing portfolio and limited maintenance capacity. This negatively impacts program operations as well as individual tenants. Submitting tickets for building maintenance is routine. Doors need fixing, heavy rains, flood program space, lighting needs replacement, and other common issues. Additional concerns involve the lack of building security, poor, out, poor or out of service elevators, and long wait times for tickets to be resolved. These are serious concerns that create significant obstacles for older adults to maintain safe and fulfilling aging in place. We'd welcome an opportunity to participate in an advisory council type structure that engages NYCHA and its community partners or an ombudsperson at NYCHA in order to prioritize these issues and identify new strategies to maximize resources and correcting them. JASA recognizes that with a limited budget, NYCHA faces constraints. We're hopeful that the RFP initiative under Next Generation NYCHA is a positive opportunity to improve the facilities at eight sites and uh, at sites and enhance New York City's range of affordable housing as well as the community programs offered at these sites. New initiatives that identify new funding sources are always welcome. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Madeline Innocent, and I'm a longtime resident of Douglas Houses. But my full disclosure is I am a member of Community Board 7 and chair of uh, Community Board 7 Task Force on Public Housing. However, I am here speaking on my own behalf and on the behalf of all the seniors in public housing, especially in Douglas Houses. I am 61 years old, soon to be, become a full-fledged senior citizen. I am worried about housing for seniors, and we will be pushed out, and we will be pushed out of the neighborhood that we feel safe and cared for by, by our neighbors. I've been on physical disability since 2002. Sometimes my physical disability stopped me in my tracks from doing the things that I did as an adolescent. Thank God my, my mind is still functioning, so I'm able to come to, to, sorry, able to come to hearings like this one today and many in the past. It was difficult for me to come here today because of my physical pains, and the older I'm getting, my pains worsen. But I keep trucking along, and I try not to complain too much. 
but I feel I am my best advocate as an upcoming senior to speak on my own behalf as well as others in, a, in my predicament that feel they don't have a voice. Telling you this personal information to tell you we in Douglas look out for the seniors because maybe their families can't administer to all their needs during the day or night, or many seniors don't have any family, or maybe they are estranged from their families living alone. There are all sorts of reasons why why we and you related to public housing should help our seniors and not threaten to downsize them, or if they don't downsize, they will be evicted. That was told to me from a few seniors. How cruel and, 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 and that is inhumane. I want to tell you about a few seniors I've come in contact with every day. One senior told me that management sent him a letter that he would be downsized and if he didn't accept the apartment that they showed him, that they would evict him. Another senior roams the street at night with her scooter, and we try to tell her she shouldn't be out, on, be out certain hours of the night by herself and that she should run errands when her home attendant is, is with her. But we all make sure this senior gets home safely. Here's another senior who goes out early in the morning but he can barely walk, and his neighbors help him to the store to get a cup of coffee. And, he, and he's done, done this for years. There are many people in our, in, in, who are in a neighborhood who care about them and will look out for them. Also, doctors are in the neighborhood and churches with people who look out for, for them. These seniors who have had a routine life the entire time live in a particular development. Lastly, it is time for NYCHA to step up and pay tribute to the seniors who pay, pay their taxes, kept them in, in sustainability compliance with NYCHA rules, as well as regulations, and have been, I'm lost here, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, regulations have been able to uh, uh, f furnishing NYCHA with steady guaranteed income from Social Security and exceptions if they die. They have been in public housing as loyal residents by abiding by everything NYCHA has asked of them, including myself. Seniors are not throwaways, but people who got old, but they are people who got older and not able to care for themselves. And I want NYCHA to, to, to do the right thing and build senior housing, or you will be doing an injustice to people who have worked for most of their lives and raised their children along with the responsibility of maintaining uh, their apartments in public housing. Uh, NYCHA should commend and revere them and not throw, away, throw them away like last year's garbage. Do the right thing, NYCHA, and stop frightening our seniors. Community is important to the lives and health and safety of the seniors. And, and I just want to say one thing. I'm listening to, NY listening to NYCHA. Many of the things they say are not true. Their managers are not equipped or have the information to help seniors or to help any resident. Um, we have had many managers in Douglas Houses. They don't even know, Douglas Houses have different factions. They don't even know that. They refuse to, to uh, honor different requests by seniors. There's seniors who have holes in their roofs, uh, but they don't want to complain because they don't want housing to harass them. This is what seniors go through in Douglas houses. Um, I've had many, um, I've sent them to uh, Assemblyman O'Donnell's office, Mark Levine's office. They are looking into these issues, but these residents are frightened. One resident have cancer. Her mother lives there. Her grandmother just passed there. She was living with the grandmother, taking care of the grandmother. She put in for a transfer to live with her grandmother. They lost the paperwork. Then they found the paperwork, but they closed the ticket. Because, but what I'm trying to urge the residents to do, don't sit back and wait for NYCHA to take care of you. You have to keep on them if you have to contact them every day. But now they're making her do a, a, a reapplication to move in so she could be next to her mother. She has breast, breast cancer. The, uh, NYCHA sat, sat here and lied through everything they said. And I think that should be investigated. They are, they are able to tell tenants things that are not true, policies that they invent. 
because people are seniors, and not only just seniors, just regular residents. I live in an apartment by myself, and forgive me if I get emotional. My apartment is in a wreck. It hasn't been painted in about 15 years. For this reason, because I'm outspoken, because I'm politically active, because I'm on community board, I speak out for the residents. They tried to evict me with fraud and lies. I won that case. But I am so, I, I played a low key so they wouldn't harass me. But I can't do it anymore after this election, this new administration. I can't sit back anymore. I'm just going to have to take the consequences of management harassing me. I need a paint job. I have repairs, but I'm afraid. But I'm not speaking for everybody else because it's more public. But when I speak out for myself, I'm harassed. So I hope you all can uh, get NYCHA to do what they're supposed to do. And as I said, I'm on Community Board 7, uh, chair for the task force. We are doing things, but as a resident, I have to do these things for myself. I can't depend on the community board to speak for me. So I'm here speaking for myself and other residents who can't speak. Good afternoon. My name is Runa Rajagopal. I'm the managing director of the civil action practice at the Bronx Defenders. I want to introduce you to Aida Reyes, who is sitting to my left. She just turned 74. She's a grandmother. She's a cancer survivor. She has lived in the Bronx for over 40 years. And in a matter of months, if NYCHA gets their way, is anyone from NYCHA here? Who represents NYCHA? <laughs> of course not. Uh, Aida will be homeless. Aida is a remaining family member who has been fighting for a lease in her name for over five years. When her mother turned 90, um, she was diagnosed with dementia. Her medical and mental health was deteriorating, right? The themes are common. Um, and even though her sister Alice, Alice is here, lives in the same building and was her mother's power of attorney, they needed more help. At first, Ida would just stay over and help her mother with her daily activities. It was not long before her mother insisted that Ida live with her. She needed the help and wanted her daughters to be with her constantly. And the decision to move in with her mother was not an easy one for Ida. Her mother was stubborn. They fought often. But ultimately, Ida decided to give her place up and move in with her mother who needed her. Ida and her family faced so many obstacles and impediments to adding her to her mother's household. They didn't know what the rules were. And so Alice, as her mother's power of attorney, called the management office to get information about how to add Ida to her mother's lease and was advised incorrectly to wait for the annual recertification and just add Ida and uh, submit the necessary documentation. Alice relied on this misinformation and waited several months, right, and lost all of that time. And they all worked together, Alice, her mother, um, and Ida, to add her name to the recertification. They submitted it to the management office and thought that was it, the matter was settled. To their surprise, weeks later, they were called in and told that actually, Ida's mother and Ida had to submit a different document, and they were handed a NYCHA application. And so Alice took that NYCHA application and reviewed it and thought, this doesn't seem right. Isn't there a separate process? Why would my sister have to apply uh, for a new NYCHA apartment when she is living with my mother? So she went back to the NYCHA the management office, and asked the staff there. And then they said, oh, you're right. It's not this application. Actually, you have to submit this form. As soon as I got the form, they filled it out, got all the necessary uh, uh, documentation, and immediately, immediately submitted it, as soon as they knew they had to submit that form. Um, unfortunately, um, just two weeks after Ida submitted that for form, her mother died, just shy of 90, 93 years old. And what happened is that during the grieving process, when their mother died, Alice and Ida were actually called in and told, uh, one, there was a problem with the form. 
Um, and two, when they learned her mother had died, they said, oh well, you can't stay in this apartment. Right? You didn't have written permission to stay here, so you have to leave. And so they illegally, right? the themes are the same, tried to bully Ida and her family and said, you actually have to surrender the keys by the end of the year, right? which is illegal. They are not allowed to do that. Um, and so on and on the story goes. They brought a, um, a petition to evict Ida, which was dismissed. They thwarted her attempts to uh, avail herself of the administrative process, and she wrote multiple letters. She waited for a hearing, and finally, uh, she started the uh, NYCHA grievance, remaining family member grievance process, but the denial was issued at the management level and rubber stamped thereafter. So after uh, the management office denied her remaining family member claim, and the borough level rubber stamped that denial, she was again brought to housing court. And again, she was on her own. And her family tried very hard to obtain legal assistance even when her mother was alive and were unable to obtain assistance. She went also to elected office, to elected office um, in various <laughs> levels of government and was not able to get assistance before then. And so she was navigating the administrative process by herself. She was in housing court by herself. Um, and experienced bullying and harassment, as we've heard, at every level. Um, and it was not until, actually, uh, Ida was referred to us by her council member, Andy King's office, actually just to give her advice. And quite honestly, for the legal services providers who are out there, at this stage, these are very difficult issues for us to litigate in courts. Right, because everything that could have happened already happened before the tenant of record uh, vacates or passed away. So I initially actually just was advising her family and as a courtesy went with her to court, but saw what I know to be true of NYCHA firsthand. Again, NYCHA attorneys who refused to give her access to her mother's tenant file, refused to give her her third step grievance, refused to, to uh, give her any accommodation um, and so that is actually how I became uh, Ida's attorney. And so we, we fought, we were able to fight for a grievance hearing, but again, the denial was rubber stamped and we have a, a, an appeal pending. But again, this is an uphill ba battle for us and the case law as such has developed as such that there are only narrow exceptions that um, allow remaining family, family members at this stage to get a lease um, in their name. Um, and so this is just emblematic, and again, we've heard these stories over and over again of, of NYCHA's mantra, which is do as we say and not as we do. And they hold NYCHA's tenants to this incredible, and their family members to this incredible standard, right? If w there's one misstep, one form that's missing, a failure to sign, a, sa a failure to document, that, that is it. They are not able to avail themselves of their rights um, or proceed, whereas when NYCHA does the same thing, um, it, they just proceed as business as usual. And what's worse is courts rarely hold NYCHA accountable for this grossly unjust double standard, which allows them to uh, continue with this uh, double standard without impunity. And just I'll quickly wrap up, which is that there are other facts to Ida's case, which is she formerly lived in public housing she had her own uh, apartment for 15 years. She uh, is otherwise eligible. Um, she pays her rent on time. You know, she's 74 years old. She's disabled. She also lives in zip code 10467, which is a priority zip code under universal access to counsel, right? Because it has the highest rate of shelter entry in the Bronx. But none of these facts seem to matter uh, because NYCHA refuses to allow her to stay. And so, um, you know, we echo a lot of the themes and statements by other tenants and advocates on various panels, but really, you know, when, we, when we're engaging NYCHA, the conversation is always assumption that tenants are aware of what their rights are, 
right? That, they're, that they have access to the very form, that they know that they had to follow this process, which is not true. And so it's wonderful to hear that NYCHA is going to begin to put uh, memoranda um, and other forms online, and I look forward to that. Their management manual should be online, but it also should, should be physically accessible and available um, in each of the management offices. Staff should affirmatively explain rules and processes to tenants. They should make home visits where necessary and not just wait for people to come with them uh, with questions. Um, I echo the um, suggestions or uh, sort of the recommendation about <laughs> affirmatively providing reasonable accommodations when they know people are disabled and elderly. Um, and really, NYCHA should hold its own staff accountable for misconduct and misinformational and take remedial steps where tenants and their family members do not meet the remaining family requirements due to their own <laughs> actions or inactions. Um, NYCHA should, needs to change, must change its culture of bullying, harassment, misleading tenants, frontline staff have to be educated about their role and responsibility in supporting and uplifting tenants and not just to arbitrarily exert power and control. Um, and lastly, as universal access to counsel rolls out, lawyers and advocates have to be appointed early in the administrative process when a tenant seeks to add a family member and not just waiting until an eviction proceeding is filed and it's too late to actually help tenants uh, and their family members avail themselves of their rights. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, thank you for your advocacy. And, and we are going to have a lot of work to continue to do to make sure that NYCHA is doing the right thing. And I said earlier in the hearing that NYCHA cannot just be a landlord, right? Landlord, they just, I mean, landlords do have responsibility of providing, you know, repairs and condition, and they're not really doing such a great job at it. But it's lacking the compassion and, the, and the, the assistance for the tenant, making sure they know their rights and making sure that, you know, that they're taken care of. And I think that we still have a, a lot of work to do to make sure that um, NYCHA does the right thing. Molly? I just wanted to make one suggestion, which is that you've done a lot of work with um, educating older adults about SCREE and you know, trying to encourage when we send out, when, when landlords send out information or when there are renewals that there should be additional information provided. And I don't know within NYCHA what the procedure is, but if in fact they're going to update some of this information and it's gonna be more readily available, then maybe there's a way for them to communicate that in their communications to tenants so that they're aware of how to access the right information once they're already working on it. Yeah, definitely. Hold them, hold them accountable. Yeah, we have to make sure that that information does get out um, so people know how, if they want to apply to include a family member, what's the procedure, what they need to do. And Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Our hearing is adjourned, and thank you to everyone again for being here.